30, I'll call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Thursday, the 4th of January. The first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The agenda is approved as warned. <coughs> The second item on the agenda is a uh, dog bite hearing. Uh, and I'd like to just start by apologizing that uh, we've been having some challenges in terms of recruiting and retaining an uh, animal control officer uh, during the two years that I've been on the board here. Uh, it's a challenging position. Uh, and uh, so uh, as a result, we don't have <coughs> as much control enforcement uh, that maybe we should. Uh, but uh, we are here to hear this hearing, and uh, I guess I'll ask for the uh, folks that uh, uh, pose the complaint to come forward first, and then we'll hear from the uh, uh, other parties. Yes. And Roger, just as a practice, this is something where the folks would be directing comments to you as chair regarding the situation as opposed to a dialogue? Right. Yes, please direct all your comments to me as chair and uh, other members of the uh, board will be asking questions. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind coming up and introducing yourself. It just yourselves. helps for the Zoom. Yes, yeah, so it helps with the microphones and everything. Okay. So. You can sit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to force you to stand up the entire. <laughs> no place in the pole. <laughs> So yeah, just your names first. Kristen Grimm. Yeah. And my name is Travis Lowell. And the incident happened on December 23rd at uh, approximately 10.45 a.m. We were sitting in the kitchen and all of a sudden I heard uh, <coughs> one of our chickens squawking pretty good. So. I ran out to see what was happening and um, saw someone sitting on the edge of our property hollering to their dog. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> went out further off the back porch and saw that the dog had killed one of our chickens. Um, I guess that's the short version of it. I mean, I just feel that, you know, there's obviously rules that were broken, and uh, that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. There should be, you know, some reinforcement of the leash law and and all uh, the um, rules that were broken. Mm -hmm. And how about uh, indemnification for the lost uh, bird? bird? <clears throat> um, she offered to pay that day. Um, she did give us cash that she had on her. Um, and I just do also want to say that, you know, we love animals and we're not here trying to get anything done to the dog or, you know, um, you know, d we don't have any harm or anything done to the dog at all. So we're here because, you know, yeah, we, you know, it was painful for us. We were in quite a shock and and didn't know what to do for a little while there. And, and we called the state police to try and figure out what the steps were that we had to do. And, um, but I just feel, you know, like you said, it's been a ongoing situation for you guys to find someone. And maybe it's time to like seek an alternate route than, you know, filling that position. You're trying to find a different type of position or at least give tickets to people or something because you know living on beside the ball field this is everyday situation you know um this has happened to her in 2020 where um, one of her chickens were killed back mm -hmm. then and the person actually took the chicken with them to hide exactly. the evidence like the dog was carrying it in its mouth and ran off and the owner like <clears throat> so this throw it in the bed of his pickup truck and took off <clears throat> i mean so this isn't the first time this has happened. Um, we've had to put a dog fence up for our own dog for his safety because we have had dogs coming up trying to attack him well, as he was well. On a run. 
while he was on a yeah, dog run on our own property. Um, the state police um, <coughs> last spring told us to put up posted private property signs, which we did, um, but obviously um, that has not helped, nor does it um, block someone from getting their animal once it's on our land. And dogs can't read either. <laughs> <laughs> only, only the very smartest ones. Um, <laughs> the, and uh, so, were the chickens within the fenced area? No. Well, the chickens can fly a little bit, but they were on our property. Right. Um, the the fenced-in area is for the dog. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> okay. And so. You're seeking more enforcement of the leash law? Correct. Anything beyond that? I, mean, I don't really know what else we can do. That's just really what we would like. Uh -huh. I mean, we have dogs. I mean, not only this incident, but the pooping and peeing on our property. I mean, it's just constant. And this was a horrific thing to watch because when I walked outside, the chicken was literally still flopping and all her feathers had been ripped out of her back and there was parts of her like meat and stuff on the ground like she was still alive while it was happening. It was pretty traumatic. I got super upset, super emotional and was yelling. I'm not going to deny that because I was really upset. Right. We don't want to necessarily yeah. go there. force you to go through <laughs> further trauma with, yes. uh, yeah. with that. So, um, you know, we're trying to look at what can we do going forward to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. Uh, I have to ask, uh, would you consider putting up a fence to further secure your property? If the town wants to pay for it. Well, if I pay for yours, I mean, I have to pay for the fence. <laughs> I mean, I think this is a town situation where <coughs> they need to, you know, do something um, because if you can't find somebody, you know, and you're allowing dogs constantly down there. And, you know, also it, the, the signs you have down there kind of contradicts the, um, the rules and regulations of having dogs on the field. Right. Um, they're not even supposed to be on the field, period. Well, again, you know, and I didn't put up those signs, but the, yeah, they put clearly up. the interpretation of uh, the town uh, back in 2015 was that you are allowed to bring your dogs on a leash uh, on Dak Row, just not on the playing fields, not on the bleachers, and maybe there's one other thing, but they have signs showing a person holding a dog with a leash and it says you're not allowed to have the dogs on playing fields on the bleachers, but the indication is that you, uh, according to that, Ordinance passed uh, what eight years ago uh, that they did expect that dogs would be allowed down there, but on leash. Um, excuse me. Can I uh, say we'll uh, <coughs> take comments after okay. we're, we're finished. Okay. Um, uh, any questions from the board? Yeah, Kim. Hi, um, Do you use your chickens for livestock? Do you sell the eggs? We do. Yeah. And they also are used to feed us. Um, yeah. The type of chicken she was was a Rhode Island Red. Mm -hmm. They actually produce the most eggs out of many breeds of chickens, where it's 300 a year, where others are less. Um, she just started laying. She was still laying where we had to not laying anymore. So we were getting only four eggs a day now. And now we're only down to three. And we have a family of three. so And we can't really afford to hurt with any, like you were, so many wise. Anyone else? Mike. You said that the dog owner enumerated you in some way, shape, or form. Was, was that commensurate with the value of the chicken? No. No. Or what she would have given to us? It was sixteen dollars cash. Okay. So a token on that. But if I understood you correctly, you're you're not asking for further remuneration from no, we're not. That individual. No, okay. This to us is not about money. It's about a pet. Yeah, it was. You know, I think it's more to us about something needs to be done with the dog issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we are 
Ideally, going to try to solve this uh, before 7 o'clock. Uh, if that doesn't happen, we have scheduled a <coughs> deliberative session uh, later on at the end of our meeting tonight. And so, we can't solve things uh, to uh, satisfaction of, of the board. Uh, before then, we'll be talking about it later on. So it seems like maybe two solutions needed. One, you know, the specific situation of like what might need to be done for follow up on, you know, the, the dog and owner in this situation with making sure everything's up to date, talking about leash laws, if there's a penalty and to provide or not, making sure the dog is, you know, registered, et cetera. And then making sure you're satisfied with like the current situation. And then secondly, what could be potentially a bigger discussion about how do we start, you know, having more enforcement, better signage, more clear, you know, if there's a penalty, what is it? Is that posted anywhere? And that transparently will probably take multiple meetings, right? You know, um, so is that kind of how you're looking at it? And yeah. that's kind of how you're what you're looking at as well, like mm -hmm. a, a current, like present, and then a bigger. Yeah, we understand that's not going to get solved tonight. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> Anybody else? Tom. Uh, just a question. Since you live right there, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> aside from signage, is there anything else we could do? Aside from signage and trying to hire someone, is there anything else we could do? You think that would improve the, the situation down there? The only other way to improve it. I mean, I, people know their signs; they know what they're doing. Um, the only way to improve it is to penalize people. And I don't. I mean. I think it needs to be more than like a twenty dollar fine because I think someone's just gonna look at that and be like, oh, whatever, <coughs> it and walk off. But I think the biggest concern here is I'm having all these dogs that on my property as well from this, this just this incident, but I don't know if they're vaccinated. I don't know if they have you know parasites or something where they're pooping on my lawn and my dog could get it. You know, it's all these things with these wandering dogs, and I really feel like it needs to be taken care of and I don't know what the best solution would be for that right now but I'm tired of it in speaking of you know you were asking if we were willing to put up a fence I mean 75% yeah. of our yard is fenced in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is because it's we're right at the end of Winooski Street mm -hmm. so all our neighbors have wooden fences all along and then so we went off and put up a fence along this side that goes to our back porch. Okay. So the only part that's open is our driveway area. Hmm. So the dogs aren't coming up the hill? Uh, yes, there? well, but our driveway is, you know. Oh, your yeah, driveway goes, goes, goes on that uh, hill? Right. Okay. Like people's dogs will come through our driveway and run to the cemetery, and then their owners will chase them. I mean, time and time again. Yeah. And we asked one lady, we're like, hey, there's a leash law. She's like, I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, Mike, have you saw this dog before off leash? Has it been multiple times? Not this particular dog, no. Not this particular dog. But other dogs. But the, I mean, she leash. was with another person, and we've seen that person <coughs> many leash. occasions with two dogs off leash. Thank you for your listening. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you in. All right. Would anyone else like to come forward to address this issue? I would like to submit public comments. Sure. This. If you wouldn't mind just coming up sure. and identifying yourself. Sure. Uh, they, <laughs> um, this is all recorded, so sure. uh, it's easier. No problem. Have the microphone. Um, my, name is, my name is Denise McCarty, M-C-C-A-R-T-Y. Um, I am good friends with Kristen Graham, um, and, um, and I support her. It was a very upsetting uh, situation. Um, I would like to um, remind <laughs> the select board that there is an animal con control ordinance, and in this particular situation, um, there's at least four sections of the ordinance that were that was violated 
So section four, running at large. Um, section five, domestic pets on public grounds and cruelty to domestic pets, um, which is also section five and section seven. And then section 12 is mandatory license, which I understand this dog is not licensed and does not have proof of vaccination um, given to the town. Um, so I wanted to bring that up um, in this meeting um, and, you know, and I think it was you that might have said, you know, what, what can be done um, to better help these kinds of situations. And my opinion would be that um, just remind people that there is an animal control ordinance in effect for the town of Waterbury, whether you post it on the Waterbury Front Porch Forum quarterly, like especially, um, you know, maybe seasonally as well. Um, I wasn't there when this event happened, but I have had my own encounters with dogs off leash when I've walked on Randall Street, when I've walked um, at the Waterbury Complex and in those fields behind the complex. Um, and, you know, a couple times they were pretty scary because I'm a small stature and when you have a big dog <coughs> charging at you, not on leash, like, you know, it, <laughs> it makes the situation pretty scary. Um, so that's why I, um, you know, I'm here to support my friend and just to advocate better enforcement of the leash law um, that is in place um, at the, within the town. Um, and also just the animal control ordinance. I understand that, you know, the difficulty of securing an animal control officer, um, but asking property owners to put up more fencing on their property uh, seems unreasonable to me when they already have their dog leashed, um, or excuse me, their dog um, contained in their own fenced in property. Um, and that was all, I, I don't wanna ramble on, but I just wanted to provide some comment for the board to consider, because um, I know that um, you know you have the ability to impose civil penalties depending on you know the violations. And honestly, like there's enough violations here that it's pretty serious. Um, and you know maybe that would send a message. I don't know what the updated animal. Um, uh, a fee schedule is. Um, I know I believe, it was talked well, about first in October. offense is fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. sure. So, um, you know, I just while I wouldn't want the dog to be harmed in any way. I am a I am an animal lover. I've had three dogs um, at once, so I completely understand. Um, but I, I do feel this is a serious situation um, with an un, um, unfortunate, you know, um, and you know, ending um, mm -hmm. yeah. occurrence. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward, Chris? <coughs> Thanks for allowing me to speak on this. Um, young lady said that uh, trying to make people more aware of the ordinance is one possibility. I think people have been, that's been beat into people's head enough that they should be completely aware of the ordinance. Uh, some people, you might as well talk to that post. You're going to get that much reaction out of them because they just simply don't care. And they don't care about landowners' rights. Um, by default, I think in this particular situation, we don't have an animal control officer. Under the circumstances of what I'm seeing and hearing here, um, you guys, by default, are the animal control officers. Not that you take that position, but if something's brought in front of you, you know, 
to have to deal with it. Uh, I would uh, suggest that property owners, if possible, get the names of these people who are allowing their dogs to run free, come to you, and, and either you can start out with a warning with these people, I think you're wasting your time doing that because they're just going to do it again, but start to impose fines to make them pay attention. And I don't mean just the $20 fine or, you know, $50 is reasonable. Uh, second offense should be double that. Um, and if the activity continues to um, happen, then maybe they lose the right of certain areas to walk their dogs completely. Uh, one other thing that nobody's mentioned here tonight just so the select board knows this, and I know nobody's going to want to hear it, but when it comes to livestock and dogs attacking livestock, you have a, the right under state law to <coughs> eliminate that dog. Because uh, I've been through it. Because my son raises chickens and he's had many of them wiped out at times from neighbors' dogs. Uh, so just that's, that's my thought on the subject. Thanks for taking my. Thanks, Chris. Any questions? Are we asking to hear from the owner? Are we asking to hear from the dog owner or none? Yeah, Amy, would you like to address the uh, group? Thank you. Sure. <coughs> I was walking my dog. I'm Amy. My, I was walking. My dog was off leash. He's great voice control, but he is a prey predator and got a chicken from the lady's property. I called him right back. He dropped the chicken. He came and sat right next to me. I proceeded to pay her. She took a picture. Me of paying her, put it all over Facebook. He is um, put it on front porch form. He is licensed and he has all his shots. <coughs> I am very sorry it happened, but here it is. But at the time, uh, he was not licensed? He was not licensed because it was seven days before Christmas, and I had moved the pre previous spring and was waiting, and that was my bad. I apologize for that. Um, the chicken, to buy the chicken, it's $3. The red, uh, Rhode, the red Island, uh, Rhode Island, red. they're about 3 bucks to buy, and I paid her $16. Um, so, yes, he was not licensed, but he is licensed. He's up to date. The vet can vouch. I apologize for the situation. Mm -hmm. And we'll keep him on a leash. Great. Any questions? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Time. I know that we are looking at reviewing the uh, fees for uh, dog licensing, uh, possibly dog uh, penalties for infractions as well. Do you, do you have anything to report on that as of yet or not? No, we're meeting tomorrow, <laughs> first before this had been Good timing. scheduled. Uh, okay. Um, just curious if anyone uh, wanted to propose a fee, uh, an infraction fee, uh, in this case. Mark. How does it work? Because according to this, there was four infractions. Mm -hmm. I know <coughs> the uh, fee schedule under the Animal Control Office ordinance has civil penalties, first violation, $50, second violation, 50, third violation, 75, fourth, 100. That's how it exists. Probably, right. probably not su sufficient. But how does that work if there are m multiple issues? <coughs> is, is that considered one, vi one violation or is that I'm just asking the question. <laughs> My interpretation of that would be an incident 
Right. You know, like, at, in 60 seconds, right. one thing happened, it just happened to cause three things. Right. So my interpretation would be like, the incident fee for this incident. And then should something happen again, it steps up. I don't disagree. I was kind of just ask, asking yeah, the question. Yeah, that was the, my interpretation. And part of the work we were hoping to get to tomorrow was to define that more clearly and perhaps bring to the board an ordinance update at some point soon. <clears throat> well, we have a recommendation uh, from a couple of people here uh, that uh, we increase the awareness that there is a uh, an ordinance, and the, the, this dog was both uh, unlicensed, on off leash, and uh, attacked uh, a chicken in somebody else's property. Um, so I think that that qualifies as an incident. Um, and so I would entertain a motion to impose a fifty dollar fine for the uh, infraction. I would second that motion. I didn't. Well, I didn't I'll, I'll, the motion I'll, ma I'll make the motion that the only way that we're going to get any kind of corrective action, if any, is, is incurring fines. And if that's in Front Porch Forum, the Waterbury Roundabout, that there was a fine <coughs> imposed, people may think twice. Some may still do that activity. But it's going to get progressive, you know, progressively. And in lieu of us, I wish we did have an animal control officer. We did. The person had to resign. We found it very difficult to engage an animal control officer. But in lieu of not having one, I think there has to be some fine involved. That's why I'm proposing a $50 fine for this, for this incident as being a first incident, first violation. What is the motion? The is motion is <laughs> no, no, no. The motion is just, just skip a, that part. You know, maybe I went into into, into discussion. A motion is for a fifty dollar um, fine for the as a first violation for the uh, for the dog animal uh, owner. Go ahead, second. I will second it to move into discussion. Okay. Moved and seconded further discussion. I think um, I'm really torn because I think in some ways it, as Mike mentioned, it will, people will hear about it, it might deter or have people be more cautious. But I also think that in terms of like the person in this incident, $50 is significantly less uh, harsh than the experience that they're going through and how difficult it is to deal with what happened. Um, so I just feel like, I don't know, that's an important piece to think like <clears throat> for themselves, the deterrent I think is what they're dealing with and going through right now, what they know the other people are going through and not ever wanting to be in the situation again, not the $50 check that they're gonna have to write to the town. Um, and if people know that fines are given, perhaps there will be some change. Um, I think the, um, Denise, I think made the suggestion about quarterly update, like quarterly announcements. And I think that's fantastic because it's not just people who've been here forever ignoring rules. It's people who are new to town. It's people who come of age and get a dog. It's family's first dogs who maybe have not looked at the rules because they've never had a dog before. So that kind of awareness um, and updated and clear ordinance, all of those things are our responsibility. And I'm glad we're on that track. Okay. Um, I think I disagree a little bit before we made the motion, Danny, with the, yes, it is one incident, um, but I kind of would, I guess I would compare it to getting pulled over, right? So you speed, you get pulled over. If you, this, uh, this dog was unlicensed, if you get pulled over for speeding and you don't have a license, two violations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it, and it, it snowballs from there. So if 
the original violation of the dog crossing into the yard had never happened, we wouldn't be having this discussion at all, right? But it transcended one violation after the next, and now someone's livestock is dead. Um, so I would, I would probably count each violation at, like if we're tallying, I would count them each as an individual violation, not just one incident at large. Yeah. Well, it's uh, a little past <coughs> seven o'clock, so I do want to move forward. Um, I'm going to support the motion as moved. Uh, I think uh, you know we can have further debate on the amount of fines and what is really going to bear some have some bearing on uh, corrective uh, behavior. Uh, but I think uh, given the ordinances that we've got <coughs> and uh, the directives that we've got, I think that's the option most open to us right now. So I'm going to support it as moved. Further discussion? Okay, hearing no further discussion, let's vote. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? All abstaining? Well, I abstained because I didn't say anything. Abstain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought we were going to do deliberative session, is where I thought you were going with this. I didn't oh. think the vote was being called, but that's okay. All right, well, the motion carries. Uh, we'll impose a $50 fine uh, on any. I apologize to all of you involved. Uh, hopefully this won't happen again. Uh, hopefully our motion here today will have some, some bearing on this. So thank you for coming. Yeah. Appreciate it. Do I get it to the town? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for coming. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Moving forward, uh, we have uh, a, the next item is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So I'm um, a motion to approve the consent agenda items with <coughs> note that it's 7.03 on the dot, and that's what you put on the agenda. And that's the way we do business we got to celebrate time. the win. <laughs> second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know, it's a little thing. Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The consent agenda items carry as warned. This is now the public session. Uh, anyone that would like to address anything that is not on the warned agenda, I would ask to please come forward. Uh, I would also ask you to uh, confine your comments to three minutes. If it requires more than that, we're happy to put it on the agenda at the next meeting. There. Okay. We'll move forward with the flood update. Uh, and we've got Tom, Liz, Tom, Gary, and Bill all here. Uh, yeah, uh, let's start with Tom. Tom, then you can uh, call on uh, your <coughs> members and then we'll move to uh, those who call. Um, not really a huge amount to report compared to the prior flood. Um, town staff did some help with some of the garbage removal. Um, we did wind up calling in Menashe to pump out, I think, one to factor out one basement. Um, but I think the rest was generally handled by people just pumping out and then the volunteers and homeowners cleaning up. Menashe was here, so we had to do some other work while they were here since it was a pretty big cost to get them here. Um, there's still, a one, there's still a dumpster out, but I think it's going any day now. Um, as soon as they come pick it up, it's, it's ready to go. Um, I think there's, um, there were a few lingering issues. Um, route 2, the trash pickup, I think, has all been corrected now. Um, but in general, it wasn't the, the debris we had the last time. It wasn't the same, same level of water, obviously. Um, no real serious damage to town infrastructure. Winooski Street down the end was, was washed out, but that's the shoulders, and that's really just gravel that they'll mostly push back in once the weather permits. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the town infrastructure, um, much less of a burden. Um, probably the, 
the mud season that we experienced after the flood was probably tougher on that infrastructure than the, than the flood itself. Really, it was a matter of the volunteers doing the cleanup. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. Gary, do you have anything further to report on part of this fire department? No, not since the last meeting. We've really not been involved at all um, in the process. We've had a busy month for, for regular calls, but <laughs> mm -hmm. not <coughs> anything for the flood related. Since the beginning of the last month. Okay. And Bill Woodruff? Uh, no, just a clarification. It was hard again, the back of the Sorry. truck. <laughs> uh, two basements. But essentially, yes, as Tom told the story, that's pretty much what we had. Okay. Thank you. I think just What's a that? kind of Vermont Gas brought their vector the first one. They had two yeah. vector days of Vermont <laughs> Gas. They bought the pumps. The first. Yeah. yeah, they bought pumps. But the three inch vector pumps. All right. Uh, Liz and Tom Drake, uh, do you have a, a report for us? Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm sitting next to Liz, who did the lion's share of the work, um, once again. Um, so thank you. What I did on my winter vacation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, volunteers rallied in. Um, we have about 130. Um, and they did the same thing as many of you were here, like in the, in the, in the middle of this um, five months ago. Uh, calling people to check in on their um, preparations for flooding as it looked like that storm was going to be a big one uh, on that day. Uh, moving things out of the basements, um, which I think we've gotten better at, at knowing that we need to do that. Uh, organizing volunteer supplies, mucking out basements, ripping out insulation after the flood had come, washing and cleaning basements. Uh, mold, vinegar, and concrobium mold, um, uh, collecting and loading dehumidifiers and sump pumps, uh, organizing meals from local restaurants, uh, delivering those meals to flood affected folks. Um, and it, it hit the same kind of areas. Uh, Route 2, um, down near uh, Farfield, <clears throat> South Main Street, Healy Court, Elm Street, that hit uh, very hard. Randall Street, mostly on the, the cornfield side of Randall Street. Um, Union Street and Huntington Place over here at Port uh, and Waterbury Center. There's still a lot of groundwater uh, up there, and you're up there with this beautiful view, and you know, just continuing pumping out some basements up there. It's really kind of mind blowing. Um, altogether, 65 to 70 buildings were reported. A um, number of those were multi family homes, uh, six day businesses, um, but those are only real estimates because. Um, some people, you know, kind of in a, a maybe a Vermonter kind of way, just, you know, dig in and, and, and don't ask for help all the time. So we don't know um, for sure that those are hard numbers, but based on what we do know, that's, those are pretty accurate. So it's really important, I'm just going to keep pushing that people report their damage at vermont211.org, no matter how much damage it was, right, inside or outside. Right, even if it was your backyard that got flooded, this is a factor in the state, whether or not the state will include Washington County. Right, we've had some conversations with some state officials in the past few days that essentially a lot of folks, including municipalities in Washington County, haven't reported their damages. And so that's why Washington County was not included on the disaster request. And it matters kind of for all kinds of things, right? So any anything from the kind of reimbursement that is potentially available to the town, um, but also in making our case with the legislature, with FEMA, with the helping organizations, because, you know, we are concerned around what is going to happen for folk who just lost a heating system that FEMA just paid to replace, right. right, through no fault of their own. We haven't even begun to start to figure out the kinds of things people could do on the household level. And as we have talked in earlier meetings, moving that electric box or moving that heating system, you know, or by an order of magnitude 
cost-wise, mm -hmm. right? Like more than replacing it, right? Replacing the electric box is X, moving it up is seven grand. You know, like it's a lot more. So we're that's kind of a longer term. We're hoping to tackle that this winter, <laughs> right? And spring, and we're still going to work on it with people once we get them back to. You have heat, you feel safe, your basement is dry, and you're not worried that you're going to get sick from your basement. Um, um, but if people me. do need assistance, they yeah, can just, um, yeah. Do you have any uh, tracking or any sense of how many people have reported uh, damage? To I got a report from 211 on December 21st. There were six people on it. Mm. Six people from Waterford. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you so actually, I think that is six people from Cruz area, which includes Moortown, Duxbury, Bolton. Yeah, because Moortown uh, and Waitsfield got hit hard. Waitsfield uh, did not have um, individual level damage. Uh, okay. But we do need them to report their bridge level damage because uh -huh. it's a key factor for Washington County. Right. Right? Yeah. But so it is, um, I'm going to ask again. They're supposed to, you know, so I have to ask them again to send me what they have now. Um, but that is a definite concern. It's the I only way the state is tracking, right? I don't, right, they, they, they haven't, I mean, we know they haven't called us to ask how many we told them, but they haven't called to ask. I've, I've, I've talked to them, generally around municipal, and we've right. had to give some rough estimates. But most of our costs are things like the debris cleanup. We don't have a lot of out-of-pocket cash for this. Yeah. And all the time, some, that sort of thing? That's all yeah, part of it, but we didn't a have a, you know, we didn't have a really big staff response to this. Well, um, I do want to say they did an amazing job, Tom, right, whether, you know, just, and, and, and Woody, like, just kudos again, right, like, getting the vector and the, um, all those pumps and, you know, getting all that debris, it, 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 I could, I could say more dumpsters, please, next time, because it helps a lot in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? We got one. Just that one on yeah. uh, the dumpster. And so it did cause a lot of angst for people about feeling that they were not, you know, I mean, it was fine. It got switched out, but the holiday in there made it a little challenging with the dumpster. But it is, I'm always going to be like, spend on dumpsters because I love them. But um, <laughs> the it just so incredible to have the, um, you know, um, public works response because they were on it every time right. and you know there's one house that had a real you know that needed the vector like really needed a lot of work that was a lot of people working and that <coughs> makes a big difference for that family it makes it you know just it's not the kind of thing we got volunteers you know um, Woody directed people it's a really big deal right we are helping um, the residents with stuff that is unprecedented for them you know um, the other folks I really want to thank are the Rotary, who organized all this food, and um, we really concentrated on getting the food out to affected families. Um, lots of restaurants either donated or provided food at cost. Rotary organized a whole bunch of volunteers, um, and we had volunteers for delivery. Not everybody got every meal, and I know some people were really sad about not getting the Stowe Street Cafe Shepherd's Pie. <laughs> but um, we did get meals to every neighborhood, you know, around the town multiple times. And it did make a difference for people during just, I mean, the holiday season, it's so overwhelming. I want to talk a little bit about the mental health impact. It is a kick in the teeth to have this happen again in, you know, just such a short space of time and the financial, you know, unsureness about what our insurance company is going to do. How are you know people going to respond? What's the impact on them going to be? It is a lot for people, and just ask people to be cognizant of that. We don't know the answers either, you know, like about what's going to happen or how it will affect people's you know insurance ratings or their values. It's a real thing. We don't know, you know, but um, that was a big focus on the um, on the on the food. I want to just emphasize, if you don't have heat, if people don't have heat, please tell them to email waterburyhelp at gmail.com or call 802-585-1152, right? We'll make sure I'll send you all this, Karen, so you don't have to, you know. But the um, Tom or I will get the message. We'll get you a space heater. We have a lot of space heaters, courtesy of the state of Vermont, who brought them to us personally. And um, it helped a lot, both with drying out basements and knowing for people to have that, you know, until their um, heating company could get there. 
And on the volunteers, I just want to say it was incredible. We both know, you know, that Kane's committee is going to be really important. The, this preparedness committee, I shouldn't call it Kane's committee, right? This preparedness work is going to be really important for the pregame, because this is going to happen again. And then, you know, to build that willingness of people to come out again and again. You know, we were pretty worried that first day when we kind of put it out and nobody signed up. And then um, Nicole Grenier put it on her Instagram. And that really started moving the needle. And we had over um, like 130, probably more than that, volunteers who did all kinds of things. You know, and so that, um, you know, like I think I told you this, Roger, like the Warren Fire Department came because they were not hit the way they thought that they were going to be. And they had an incredible job to do, and they made an incredible difference for the family that they helped. You know, just a whole, you know, half a dozen people just moving in power and through. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of stuff really matters. And I just want to say, like, we're, we're going to get good at dealing with this, mm -hmm. right? And being able to manage volunteers and attract volunteers and thank them is part of that. But it doesn't, you know, I was, I just want to mention before I came in, I was on the phone with the Vermont Disaster Relief um, Fund, and they are starting to move their process forward about helping people become whole from July. But they're still not there yet. And, you know, it is a real challenge for folks. And um, the, the fella on the other end of the phone said, I didn't think we would need this again so soon. He was talking about between Irene and now. Mm. Mm. And I said, I think we should think of this as a um, athletic event that we want to get very good at. Mm. Right, learning how to deal with it. I think a general you know, theme I'm seeing um, you know, with neighbors, with flood affected folks, is, is just a sense of numbness, you know, a sense of weariness, a sense of, yeah, I can, you know, the water keeps coming in my basement, I can keep mucking it out. It comes in, I can muck it out, but I can't keep the river in its banks, right? Who can do that? And I know there's a lot of talk today in Montpelier about it, and, and you know, also talk about how expensive that's going to be, but I think that's where people are thinking is okay, like, who's going to help with the bigger mitigation? And is it, the town, and I don't think it's the town, because I think it's, you know, somebody said in some article recently that it's kind of like the electrical grid, right? It's just, it's this whole system. So is it the state? Is it FEMA? Is it the feds? Um, I don't know, but I hope that answer can, can come. Um, and whether it's lowering cornfields or, or putting in berms or, or doing something, um, because, you know, if it's going to be happening multiple times a year, people will, will, will leave. Mm -hmm. will. Yeah, and Brian Voigt, uh, who's uh, one of the project uh, coordinators for this Winooski watershed, uh, is going to be coming to address the select board on Monday, uh, okay. January 8th, uh, with uh, some <coughs> potential solutions. Bill? Yeah, I'll come up soon. I just want to uh, amplify what Liz said a little bit about the Vermont Disaster Relief Fund. You're all elected officials, and, and though you don't like to admit it in one sense, you're politicians. Uh, the Vermont Disaster Relief Fund isn't a, a direct agency of the state, but the state has a lot of input into what they're doing. Uh, I'm not sure who appoints uh, the people to that board. But it's very frustrating that, and Liz just alluded to it, um, in Waterbury, between Crew and the Good Neighbor Fund, we've probably spent and distributed uh, to local folks about $85,000 since July. <clears throat> the Vermont Disaster Relief Fund is called the Table of Last Resort. And they haven't opened the Table of Last Resort yet, even for July. So even though I went through this in Irene, it's really amazing to me the patchwork, patchwork quilt of where funding comes from to, to uh, try to provide assistance to those who've been impacted by the flood. We all know about FEMA. 
and you know you submit your claim and you get twenty-five thousand dollars from FEMA, that's great. But that's generally not going to take care of everything that you need. The Good Neighbor Fund steps in and they help. You know they might help you uh, do some repair, repairs to a car that got flooded. They might help you buy a refrigerator or a stove that you need. Um, you've got a whole litany of faith-based groups, the Catholic Church, the Lutheran organization, um, uh, Habitat for Humanity, which isn't faith-based faith necessarily. But you've got all these uh, you know, not, uh, NGOs out there that are, are providing help. And all of them say, well, here's some money. You can use it. You, you can buy materials with it, but you can't pay contractors with it. And then this group has other rules. And our job in crew is to try to orchestrate how to put all these puzzle pieces together just to get $5 into somebody's pocket. Mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating and very difficult. So all I'm asking you, and I, I want people who are watching to know, but the state legislators need to be told this. Our local ones know this, but the state legislators, when you talk to them, you got to tell them we need to get the Vermont Disaster Relief Fund open and available. It's five months since that happened, and people are still waiting. And we're providing what we can to, for their immediate needs just so that they can live. But if they're really going to recover from this, they need assistance from the Vermont Disaster Relief Fund. And, and the folks, I mean, I was writing an email today. I didn't send it yet because I needed some, some more information. But, you know, we're going to try to put a little bit of pressure on these folks to let's get to the table and open the purse so people can move forward. So anything that you can do when you talk to state legislators, um, if you're in the state house at all, if you go there, the governor's office certainly is a key to you know opening the the purse strings there, the, the the purse itself. I mean, so anyway, I just want you to be aware of that that this is a complicated and complex um, tangled web, mm. and and for the folks out there, I mean, without. I mean, we're frustrated dealing with it. The people who are impacted by the flood, they're just burned out. They don't know where to turn, and they're just floundering and, you know, in a sense, drowning in this, oh, go here, go here, go there. And it's, it's really tough. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank you know, all three of you and everybody that's <coughs> been involved with this. Uh, I was away uh, during this last uh, incident, so I was not uh, available to, to help out much, uh, uh, if at all. Um, but uh, I, I really do appreciate uh, everything that uh, you folks have been doing uh, and will continue to do. Um, Danny, you want to add your hand Yeah, before we change the subject there, Bill, I wonder if you have an email that you've written that maybe crew could turn into a template and we could ask volunteers to send you know emails to legislation um, you know outside of us as town representatives which we can you know put some contact but I think there'll be plenty of folks who'd be willing to you know just edit the template and sign their name and I think I in, in general right like meaningful. just even to add on that like I don't know you know some of you may remember um, the rebuild Waterbury raised a million dollars Mm -hmm. You know, and and spent like about ten thousand per household, to and they were doing first floor rebuilding, right? Like we definitely we weren't walking in with some like idea of a budget or whatever, right? But we knew we wanted to help people afford to move their stuff, make basements empty, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the long term goal, right? And probably ten thousand dollars on our part. Per household is what it will take, but there has to be other money coming to the table to help with that, right? And it's not just this, the, the, the challenge now is how patchwork everything is, right? And how limited things are. So if you don't meet that income thing, you're off by a thousand bucks. You don't get the Efficiency Vermont deal. You don't get the, you know, it's very, 
it's much less generous in so many ways than it was after I read. I think that is just a real right. experience for people. And, you know, the, to put the point, you know, we're, it's not just people will leave, right? They won't be able to, to live here because of the fear of flooding, right? Or, the, or, or just taking a giant financial hit every few years, right? They won't be able to maintain the standard of living. And that will be bad for us as a town. You know, is right. I mean, Tom said it day one. We cannot afford to lose giant swaths of our town to, you know, rain. That's because it's just, if, I mean, we're going to have to get very good at all of this. I just think we didn't expect we would have to become very good at piecing together every little piece of money we could find um, because it has just, is actually much harder than. Um, I think it should be, especially for folks who are already dealing with um, financial constraints. And so they don't have a retirement fund to tap, or they don't have equity in their home to tap, or all the things that folks who have more resources tap when the going gets really tough. You know, and that is, is just such a big concern. You know. Um, so yeah, we'll find something that you know folks can share out. I think, we'll, and we'll also, as as Tom said, put pressure on the legislature around we need a bigger conversation about the river. Right, and I think that conversation is happening. I mean, you heard over the past couple of days in the legislature and uh, with the governor. I mean, the, the, that conversation is alive and well. Uh, solutions are a little harder to find. Um, but I do, uh, you know, on, on the glass half full side, I did want to also congratulate you on doing, uh, again, a tremendous job of, of responding. I mean, I think uh, Waterbury is, is really cognizant of the fact that we have a tremendous volunteer response. It's well coordinated. Uh, the volunteers uh, that I was talking to uh, at the, the meeting uh, with the uh, Flood Preparedness Committee, recognized that uh, you know we, we have something that other towns don't have and they want to replicate it they specifically want to talk with you and Tom about what you do know what you have learned and so that we can incorporate that into a system going forward well I think we got to give it back right like that we have a great select board we have a great town manager and former town manager. We have a town clerk who knows every <laughs> single property. We have a chair of public works the same. I mean, we are so lucky in the talent that we have in this room, right? Like Gary, right? Woody, Karen, I can't, like, I can't say enough about how much it helps to be able to say, oh yeah, yellow house, about two doors down from whatever, yeah, do this, right? They use the back door. Like any, right? Like, or oh, you know, she's in a nursing home, like her son's living there, whatever. Every piece of information you need to be able to help people is here in people's heads, and it makes such a big difference to have that. You know, and for us to be able to give people good instruction, is because we're backed up by all these people doing this great work. I just, it's incredible. Okay, unless there are other questions, we have other things on the agenda. We'll be Thank continuing you. this discussion. Yeah. Again, appreciate your time coming forward. Roger. Yes, sir. Who'd you say was coming in on Monday? Uh, Monday? Brian Voigt. V O I G T. Excellent. Yeah. The Watershed Project Coordinator. Okay, uh, the, uh, the agenda will be coming out tomorrow, um, but uh, yeah, he's been preparing for uh, more than a month. Uh, he's got some interesting stuff to say. All right, uh, next thing on the agenda is the Recreation Committee update. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Frank Spaulding and his team for the work that they've been doing over the past couple of months. Uh, I'll not steal your thunder. Uh, you wanna... I'm going to slow talk while they're getting the technology figured out. <laughs> oh, okay. But, um, All right. I wanna... You could introduce your team. Yeah, I want to introduce uh, Paul Lawson, who's a member of the Recreation Committee. Well, you guys, Katarina's on the team, and I'm on the team kind of thing. But, um, Paul, you're welcome to come up if you want. Yeah, if you want to come join Paul. Uh, I want to. Um, I got a T-shirt. So I want. Frank. I'm with Stu. Liz just says I'm. Frank, your turn. I'll say no. I'll be Frank. 
Um, there is a T-shirt. I'm going to get everybody. That's great. Um, thank you. Thank you. So thanks for asking us to come in. It's been probably been I don't know quite a few years since the rec committee's presented to the, to the select board. Um, I want to um, first of all I want to acknowledge the great team that you have um, in the town, Tom and Katarina. Um, it's just been a uh, been a joy to to be on the committee and working with those folks. I want to thank you all for 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 who you are and what you do. Um, so we're here to talk about really about the project prioritization list. I could you got to keep me on track because I could go fully nerd and talk about recreation for hours. <laughs> so, but, minutes left, so but yeah, so we'll, we'll be we'll be we'll be focused here. So we're here to talk about the project prioritization list. And uh, before I do that, I want to introduce myself a little bit. I am the chair of the recreation committee, but in my uh, day, do my day job, I'm the project manager for Vermont State Parks. And I've been doing that job for 25 years. So a lot of what you're going to hear tonight is um, is, is is really the work of the, the recreation committee, but is found the foundation of it is is in my other work. Um, and so really, we're focused on how we pro uh, talk about prioritizing projects. And it's been my experience that um, um, there's projects usually prioritized through some pretty inefficient ways. The, my favorite is the uh, uh, one to break, so that's a priority now. The other one is uh, the squeaky wheel, and then the other one is the uh, last thing seen. Um, very inefficient ways to prioritize projects, but I'm sure pretty much systems that everyone's familiar with. Um, so about 25 years ago, the Vermont State Parks went through and inventoried their entire infrastructure system, and we hired an architect that came up with a project prioritization system for Vermont State Parks. I have shamelessly pirated that system at least three times now, um, and I brought it to the Recreation Committee several years ago, many years ago. So what you're actually going to view tonight is the third review of this, this system in, in, in Waterbury Recreation Committee. Um, we actually have done it with other departments and state government um, within the forest and parks uh, around to prioritize projects. And so it, it, is, it is ground truth. And it's, um, and it's really a project queuing system. Um, it's, it's not really, a, it's a project scoring system, but it's really a project queuing system. And we like to say it that way because a project um, is just in queue. It's just something good that's waiting to be done. Doesn't necessarily mean just because it doesn't get done this year doesn't mean it never gets done. It just doesn't get done this year. So it really is a queuing system, and it compares projects, project descriptions against a set of criteria, and those criteria are what you see on the screen before you. Um, and 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 so, what I want to say is it, it is it is a, a comparison system. What this system is not, and I think it's important to start with that, it is not absolute. This does not give you the answer. This is not to say I have thirty thousand dollars to spend. I'm going to take these next projects. It is a sorting system that, that roughly sorts projects and lets you know what is rising to the top of the pail of milk, what's the cream rising to the top, and what's not necessarily at the top yet. Again, it's a queuing system. Um, it's not comparable against other initiatives in town. We're not striving to compare recreation projects with road projects. We're just not. That's your job, not ours. Um, what we are doing is, is trying to compare recreation projects against recreation projects. Um, it doesn't create money. It doesn't, as far as I know, this has not printed a single dollar, has not added a single dollar to the budget. But what it does, what its value is, is it's a queue. It, is, it shows you um, what's up next, possibly. It makes you incredibly ready for money that does come along. Say, for example, if the Land and Water Conservation Fund suddenly coughs up $2 million available for communities to compete for, you, you know where to start looking for projects. So that is what it does. So that, that's value. Um, and, and, and in my experience in using this list for my work, that has been a true value. I've been to the legislature, I've been given, there was one year back when the, the economy crashed in 2009, I was given eight hours to come up with a $40 million list. And I did it because we had this list in hand. So that's how we do, that's what the value of it. Um, it also memorial, memorializes projects that may fall off people's radar. Recreation committees come, recreation committees go. This list, this queue can be there and, and, and go beyond the people that are on the committee. So how does it do this? It does it by comparing the projects to this value map right here. And so these are criteria. And this is, this is the biggest part of the work that the committee did, is we went through these criteria, which really represent our values as a committee, what we value a project to do for the town and the people of Waterbury. Um, so we went through and we, we, we checked these criteria. Um, these represent the values of the Waterbury Recreation Committee. 
and they were placed in order because you got to have winners and you got to have losers. And um, and but but these were like okay, what's the most important thing goes on top, and that gets the most points, and then you back the points down to the bottom of the list. They're all very important criteria, but you have to rank them in order for this to work. And so we we did that, and we developed this list, and and we put them in this order. And it is a weighted priority list. And then we took this and applied the projects to these criteria. And, and the magical spreadsheet spits out an aggregate score. Um, so before we go on, are there any questions about the criteria portion of this, of this spreadsheet? Is that uh, third column the weights that are accorded? So to yeah, column C criteria? is the weights. So that's the point system. So and when you see the next uh, spreadsheet, you know the spreadsheet will have an X in that column that you'll see, yeah. and it will actually grab those points and add to the score. So okay. for example, and you're going to see this in the results, uh, a project that corrects a non-compliance with a code is going to automatically get 100 points versus a project that doesn't. Yeah. Um, you know, a project just because it correct it's compliance with codes, if it doesn't do anything else, it could still not be the top project because there could be a project that clicks a lot of other boxes that makes it more valuable in terms of our criteria. Right. Might not necessarily be the first project you do still, but you know, it's, it's, it, it, it ranks the project. Can, Karen, do you mind just scrolling down so you can, I don't know if there's... Show the winners. The low. <laughs> the low. They're all winners. They're all winners. <laughs> yeah, that that stuff on the bottom is me working with the spreadsheet. Do it now. Or zero. <laughs> oh yeah, now we see the override. <laughs> the cheat so, code so, hiding so, up the bottom. Yeah, so, oh. That used to have like 500 points on that at one point. <laughs> so um, I, I've, I've that, that 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 key that, that love, I've, I've often called it the God key. But the um, they're 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 you know there's there's ways to and, and I, I know that when the spreadsheet this system's been used by the departments and they've blown it up to be something very complicated and I think it's I think it's beautiful in its, in its simplicity. Uh, the reality, and that goes back to this is not an absolute. This list goes to someone. It goes to Tom. It goes to Katarina, and they look at it and say, "Okay, what makes sense for our budget? This one, this one, this one, that." One. Or, or someone comes along with a pocket full of money. Guess what? Do it now, because it's on the list. It's something we want to do. It has value. Clicks criteria, but now the money's here. You do it now. Opportunity is mm -hmm. is is a viable criteria. And we've done, I've done that a lot in the state when someone, um, uh, our current governor, when he was in the Senate, said, I want you to spend a million dollars on alternative energy. Okie dokie. So we went to the bottom of the list and we did a bunch of projects on alternative energy. Within the energy. park system. Within the park system, yes. So we put solar panels on a bunch of, of things. So we've, we've, we've pressed that do it now key many times. And it, there used to be a bunch of points on it, but that just, you know, just, if you're going to do it now, just do it now. So we just kept it there because to convey the fact that there is an override to this because it is not, again, not absolute. Right. Okay. Can we go into project list though? Sure. So we took these projects um, and this represents, uh, I've updated, you know, we went through this at the last meeting. So that's what you, um, we finished updating it. Um, the projects that are in yellow are actually uh, uh, projects that the, the I would have more literally brought to the table. Scott brought them to us. Um, we may have scored them, but I wasn't sure, so I thought to be safe, I wouldn't convey them as being finally scored. Uh, so we, the, 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 and that actually conveys that this list is continuing and will be built out and will be updated regularly. This is meant to be a living document. That's why I, when I sent the copy, it's just a copy. Um, you know, this is, this is a list that should continue to be built because again, it's a queue, not an absolute list. Um, and if you scroll to the right a little bit, Karen, see that um, uh, you'll see that these columns come into play. Mm -hmm. If you scroll all the way to the top, I meant to freeze the frame on that. Oh, there's one on the top. These people are getting sick that are on the call. I'll find it again. Mm -hmm. I don't feel great. It's the A, B, C, D, right? From your right previous. Oh yeah, it's just small. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the row needs to be expanded. That's all. Just just expand that down till you see the text. Uh, row one, even just drag that like down. Like you just did even more. There is something. Hey, if you're not going to have fun, why do it? Right? <laughs> we are we're on the recreation committee. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's, there's the criteria listed across there. We hit the X. The magic formula on the far right of the screen does the, uh, does the math for us. 
Um, and then it kicks out a score, which actually I brought back over because I didn't want to have to scroll all the way to the right to see it. Um, and we have a note field. Um, we went through each of these projects and said, does it meet this criteria? And we literally asked the question, does this project, and then you read the criteria, yes or no. And we did a you know, a variety of selection methods, including thumbs up, thumbs down, um, to say yep or no. And uh, generally, the, the weight of the group carried the day, and we, we went forward with the scoring system. Mm -hmm. And so if you, scroll, if you scroll back to the left, you'll see this is all sorted based on the weight of scoring. And what you're going to find is that the types of projects that score high are projects that deal with accessibility um, and, and things that are really wanting to be done. Um, you'll notice the top one is the long-range plan for Anderson, and that was one we added at the last meeting. And, and that was really, we were getting a lot of requests talking about, you know, this kind of item to go to Anderson, that kind of item to go to Anderson. We got the pool to deal with, we got the whole recreation building concept, and we were realizing that we really got to figure out what we're going to do with that park. Um, and for a variety of reasons, all the criteria that get clicked, because it really triggers out a lot of activity, um, you know, we, that ended up scoring pretty high. Um, and so as you get down, you'll see there's other things at Anderson Fields um, that are selected for projects. And if they ranked high, you know, as you look at this list, as Tom Cattery look at this list, you might say, I, I know that this, this project at Anderson scores high, this individual project, but, but we really need to do this, that, that plan first before we do that. So let's skip that project and move to the next. So that's, that's really how this list works, this queue, I should say. Any questions on the projects? I'll just mention that uh, we are, Tom and I are planning to come to your uh, next meeting a uh, week from tonight uh, to talk about long range planning for Anderson. And yeah, and Anderson, we, we uh, at the end of the last meeting, after looking at this list, it's actually informed us that, yeah, that's it. The, this and that meeting is going to be all Anderson only. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 we invested it's, quite a bit of time and funding actually uh, looking at uh, two other parks, uh, Hope Davy and uh, yeah. the Ice Center area, yeah. which still doesn't have a name other than the Ice Center, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. The, uh, you know, I was thinking about it on the way down here, it's like, you know, and, and in this queue, it's like I think one of the items is a, a, a town wide ADA item for the recreation facilities, which is something we should, we should be done. But we have. Mm -hmm. um, the long range plan for the, the ice rink parcel and, and Hope Davy addressed ADA. Mm -hmm. So we can take those two properties off that list. Yeah. Because and we did it. That's uh, something that Katarina is already addressing up at Hope Davy. Yeah. So it's like we're, you know, we're, it's all a lot of moving parts. Um, um, you know, this, our group uh, really, you know, you know, believes that recreation assets and recreation infrastructure is a very vital, important part of our town and the livability of our town and, and its economic liability and it's what attracts residents to our town. And, um, um, I just, uh, so so we, we've treated this with the respect we feel it deserves and, and really want to create a product that allows this to carry forward and be informative well into the future. So, any more questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I got one. Um, I saw that, that the skate park was mentioned at two different parks. Is that because we are still technically considering two different parks? Yeah, so the long range plan um, includes the long range plan for the ice center includes the skate park down there, and the long range plan for Up Davy included the replacement of the skate park up there. Um, I think uh, that's one of those ones where you got. Um, that's, that's the do it now key right there. If they've got fundraising that's raised a bunch, a bunch of money and, and can make that funding happen, then let's do it now. Um, if it's both, they've both been identified as attractive features to have in our town recreational infrastructure. Um, that's that's kind of how that, 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 that list works. Um, in terms of how you see like long term kind of the rec committee and engaging with this in terms of, so I guess starting with list of projects I assume some are from kind of ongoing municipal initiatives you talked to Katarina is it things the rec committee developed is it you know I have an idea for wouldn't it yeah. be cool if like what well, where did that fold us come kind from? of all of this all of that you know like Clyde Woodmore Little League uh, Scott brought the Clyde Woodmore Little League stuff a lot of that's just maintenance stuff that they've got the money for and probably may not even rise to being needing to be on the list, but we'll put it on there. Um, you know, 
uh, advocacy groups like the skate park folks, um, individuals, um, you know, the committee members actually put a lot into this too. We actually did a tour. We, yeah. took, we, we drove around. I mean, it's I had never really realized that the seminary had a field, mm -hmm. you know, that was ours. Um, yeah, you know, as long as we were on that, yeah. 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 So that was, you know, going and seeing him. And made a big difference, and that, for me. And that project was born that day. We just said, remove dugout and fencing. It's not needed anymore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of, that's, that's, you know, we just couldn't envision that ever being needed as an asset for that park again. So let's get, let's get it. There's two ways to attack a, a list of projects you got to do. One is to do them, the other is to get rid of them. Um, yeah, Kevin, sorry. I would just add to that that if someone comes up with an idea, the reason why we have the scoring system is that if it's not an idea that meets many of those criteria, it's a way that it might fall to the bottom of the list, but it's still on the list. Or mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, it could be the newest idea and it rises right at the top because it's the best idea. One of the things that we did not include, and, and I asked Frank about it in my last meeting, was, you know, there's not a budget item here. Mm -hmm. This is purely, there's no money involved. This, this is everything other than the cost of it, okay? Because um, that's obviously probably going to be number one. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what is the other question I would have for you and Tom is if you guys have a plan or, or some ideas, it would be fantastic to get them ahead of the meeting so we could do a little homework and ask questions then rather than <coughs> wait up, you know, hear it and then ask the questions. Mm -hmm. okay. I can tell you briefly right now some of the conversations so in, in the pool work that and, Alec, and I don't want to hold up your regular <coughs> slide. I can, I can be pretty quick. Okay. In the pool work that Alec has done, and Alec, and I say this in the most fond way, is a <laughs> typical engineer. You ask him to do something, he gives you 38 alternatives, okay. which is great. So he keeps coming up with, every time I think he's settled on a concept, he, he comes up with, with one that's better and cheaper. So I'm not rushing them because that's what we want them to do. <laughs> See, we turned it correctly. <laughs> but one of the concepts is that, you know, relining the pool or redoing the pool in some form, the demo is expensive. So what if we don't demo it? What if we demo, you know, the top foot in the building and put it in the pool and put some clean fill and build the pool where the ball field is and move the ball field where the pool is, which is conceivably cheaper and easier. So that's one concept, but that brings up, well, that's rejiggering the whole Anderson field. Exactly. Um, oh, disposal in situ. Nice. But it may be possible, and it may be cheaper than, um, than demoing the pool and, and dealing with all the, presumably trucking that to, I don't know where, um, maybe just Woody's yard, but maybe, maybe a landfill. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, there's fiberglass and concrete and all this stuff. Um, expensive to get rid of, but if we could just get rid of know, the top foot of it and maybe the sidewalk around it, building, dump it in the pool and put a few loads of clean fill, maybe we can build a ball field on that. So when that idea came up, that caused you to think a little bit differently than just building a new pool. Mm -hmm. and the demo work in theory, um, in theory and practice, could be done by our crew. Demo day. Sorry. Yeah, Woody's crew has got all the time in the world to do stuff. <laughs> Definitely in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that's to, to say out loud, we haven't done the rest of capital planning for this year yet, so we can yeah. try and have that ahead of time if that was the other part of that right. question. Right. But in the end, I think the, you know, the numbers he gives us for the pool are going to dictate a lot of our thinking because they're not going to be, it's not a $20,000 project. Mm. Mm -hmm. You said it was getting cheaper, not, not that cheaper. Not that, not that much cheaper, no. Yeah. It's still going to be well in seven figures, trust me. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this is a continuous work in progress, uh, just as our infrastructure is, so we're, we're happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is great. I want to really thank you for, you know, coming up with a plan and then implementing it uh, and, uh, you know, having this prioritization, as you say, helps us provide at least a screen for what does this do for the town, what, what criteria does it meet, and uh, how do we prioritize the capital improvements uh, for recreation in our town. Yep, and, and thank you. And, and I actually want to express, express appreciation for, uh, for you coming to the meetings. I think the thing, you gave us a target to hit, 
said, do we want to do this? I said, okay, we had a target to hit, which allowed me to be semi-dictatorial in the meetings to get, get us to the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was, it's, uh, it was a good exercise, and it's, it's not done. We'll keep going. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. On time? Uh, for the questions, Mike. Do you have any comments on, I know this is probably Katarina's part of the equation, but in terms of the budget for the upcoming year for the rec, rec department? I don't, I don't know the budget, so okay, I, don't, so I don't, don't have any I didn't know if the man is, has discussed that with Katarina. We, um, I, I will say this about how the committee work has changed to, to answer that question a little bit, is we've become a little less involved in the day-to-day. The town now has a full-time director, which whose job it is to manage a day-to-day -day and a, a program uh, manager as well. I know that when I joined the committee, the committee it was a part-time recreation director. The committee was more involved in the day-to-day. -day. Um, we stepped back from that and tried to try to really uh, grab grab onto the longer-term planning. Ten thousand foot view. Uh, yeah, more more strategic thinking about recreation in the town and let 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 Katarina do her job as well as she does. Okay. Yeah, the number of people that were thrilled when you got your job, okay, I mean, it was just, just stuff. It was really, really, really graphic. So anyway, thanks. That that's my way of answering your question. No, that's that's yeah. that's what I thought, but I just yeah. I'm curious if the committee has discussed anything. One uh, another question I had. I mean, one of the things that was attractive about uh, bringing in uh, Tom Lights was that. Uh, St. Albans had just put in a pool, uh, a 12-month 12, uh, 12 pool, uh, and uh, so we had like, you know, great visions of what the, how this was going to just happen in Waterbury. Uh, as it turns out, it's a little more complicated than that. But uh, the one of the things that, that St. Albans did was to solicit uh, the involvement of all the surrounding towns. So they're all contributing to the maintenance of, of that uh, pool. And I'm just wondering, you know, Waterbury is the largest town in our school district, uh, attracts uh, people from, you know, all the surrounding towns to a certain degree. Uh, certainly we go to, to other towns as well, but I'm just wondering, to what degree are you thinking strategically about Waterbury's recreational facilities in, in this general area? Uh, I, no, I don't believe we have thought about it strategically as a committee. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I do. I think we have talked about the fact that we tend to be the recreation destination for, like at least Duxbury and some more town and that sort of thing. Um, and and I, but I, so what I'm going to speak about is my other professional experiences. I do know that out in the Midwest, that um, a lot of park park districts are regional in nature. Mm -hmm. and, and you won't see towns having their own recreation. You'll see like a, you know, five river metro parks, uh, metro parks, Cleveland. I mean, even Cleveland's a big town, but I mean, obviously a city. Uh, but, but you'll see, see communities come together and create districts. They actually have their own tax base. You know, mm -hmm. They actually have their own tax rate um, throughout the community. And that's, that's um, so I, I have thought about it in my head, but we've not addressed it as a community. If you go to New York State, it's much more community. County based, yeah, right. Like the uh, or if you want, if you really wanted to think about it a different way, you could think about it as we have districts for the tent, for B trans. Uh -huh. um, that that would be an interesting way to kind of look at it. You were in District Six, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and there, uh, uh, coming from our neighbor's town, I, I kind of look at it and go, okay, what do we have that other towns don't? Yeah, who would be one of them? Okay, including. Uh, uh, an outdoor pool, mm -hmm. you know, right. or a twenty or a twenty, you know, a twelve-year pool would be better. One thing you want to think about, I would want to have people think about, it, is that the pump system for a pool is very similar, if not almost exactly the same as a rink. Hmm. Uh, my wife has managed pools in about three states, and was mentioning that to me, and I was like, you know, that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. That may be something different. I think the thinking about the other communities does happen. Like if, if we were to say, okay, I want to build um, um, a giant soccer complex. Um, we don't have the flat space to do it. This doesn't get flooded every year. But I mean, but just as an example, you know, Waitsfield kind of has a big kind of uh, the, 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 they have the big field. Yeah, uh, Kingsbury Fields. Yeah, the Kingsbury Fields. So I think it would probably fall into that realm where we would compare, figure out if that is offered nearby enough where we would want to have to invest in it. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, that's that's you're absolutely right. We should be thinking more regionally than we are, but our tax base and the way we pay for stuff yeah. doesn't allow that at this point in time. Right. Yeah. Unless there's magic. Okay. Well, great. Uh, any further questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Before we dive into the budget, I'm going to use that one. Let's get another space heater. Thank you. Now we've got this man. Yeah, one man. Um, all right, next thing on the agenda is the budget. Uh, we're going to try to treat three items today public works, including the capital budget, fire department, and then we'll go. That one's not working. But I think that one tends to blow the circuit. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> that one looks like it came from East Germany. It's like her. Yeah. Some of these glasses in the Civic here. Right? Uh, State Highway 8 is, is more or less a base amount you get from the state every year. We got some extra aid this year, but it's not something that we can plan on forever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I don't believe the amount would come down. It's never really come down um, in case we get a little errors, but I think getting budgeting what we have this year is pretty reasonable and safe. Um, no other real major revenues. Um, on the highway side, there's some miscellaneous revenue and permit revenue and things like that. Um, the pay side, there's a there's a pretty significant change. Um, in 2023, we had um, money in the budget for a mechanic position, which we were not able to fill. Right. I think we've essentially given up. Um, so that's out. Um, at the same time. Um, what I'm proposing is that there's a, there's an employee who's been working for EFUD, generally on the water department issues, has actually passed his water license. Um, he's also on the fire company and was, I think, junior firefighter a year, a year ago. But it seems to be working out pretty well. Um, what I'm proposing is that he becomes a joint town EFUD employee full time with benefits. Um, EFUD would, play, would pay a third of his salary in fringe, the town would pay the difference. Um, and the, the rough plan is that from the town side, um, he would help us out, what we really need it is that um, cemeteries, park, recreation would work. Um, would he manage to hire another part-time person that would help in some of that work? And we struggled with that the last two years. Another another person, another firefighter, um, who's retired, and will do it full time in the summer, which is really what we need to keep those costs down. So that should free up some of the public works crew to do less of that and more road maintenance. Um, How are you going to deal though, with the uh, mechanic, the need for the mechanic and somebody to to provide? The so far, we figured out. Um, most of what we have are the heavy equipment's under warranty, heavy trucks are under warranty. Uh -huh. um, so we've, um, we're generally just doing the work at the dealers and taking for inspections, and we do some of our own piece work and the little changes, things like that. Um, 
you know, we missed the mechanic, but I think we could hire a mechanic, but we'd probably pay 15 an hour, is my gut. And our old mechanic, Eric, has agreed to come back and inspect vehicles. Oh, so. <coughs> he does a lot of work here and there. Yeah. yeah, so. I think he also assists the fire company on a limited basis. Yeah, uh, <coughs> he's helped. One of our officers does a fair amount of work on the trucks, but he also talks with him and gets some guidance. But it'll, it'll be nice to have him be able to, to do the inspections when he be uh, EFUD, I almost said something different. EFUD uh, employees, uh, he's worked it out with Tom and Bill about doing the, the annual service, which takes a fair amount of effort. And then the mechanic can just come in and go through the motions, <coughs> do the official inspection without having to do all the other work. So we've got a plan in place, and it's just a matter of getting it rolling. Because if we had to send these trucks out, the cost would be yeah, that's significantly yeah. bigger. Yeah. Okay. And the other piece is I, I broke out that we've never in the past um, budgeted for overtime. It was all in. Um, just the payroll, and so I, I didn't change the 2023 budget, which was adopted. But I went back in the history and broke out overtime. Mm -hmm. And in 2024, I also broke out overtime separately. So we're not really seeing a $50,000 reduction in public works payroll. I've broken it out differently, and I, you know, you sort of pick your battles about how detailed you want each one to be. But if overtime, you know. I'm, in 2024, I'm thinking it was about 36 grand. That's meaningful enough, I think, to have its own line on it and to see it differently in the budget. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, you know, health insurance is is what it is based on the plans we have and the, the cadre of folks we have, and the, the benefits are formulaic. Um, no real big changes as you go down. We are budgeting um, until you get down um, to line 41, which is equipment maintenance and then vehicle maintenance, and we're proposing some increases there, and part of that is what we just talked about. Um, a little less, less in-house, and so we're gonna have to spend more at other places. Um, <coughs> diesel's down a bit, and reluctant to go down too far. We may have another lingering bill or two for 2023, and I know prices have gone down recently. Worried about being stung a little bit, but I, I actually think, and looking at it further, that. You know, we might spend 60 on diesel this year, so I, I think 72.5, I can probably mm -hmm. tuck that down a little bit. So want to get the margin of error and be something like maybe 65. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Pretty significant savings uh, versus budget this year. Yeah. Um, then going to the, to the second page, um, <coughs> despite, um, despite, having a plan where we, I'm not sure we're gonna use less salt because every year is different, but we're gonna not apply salt in some areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about 10% of our paved roads, but nonetheless, the price per ton is up more than 10%. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, um, you know, something- Well, at least we're gonna blow the top off. Yeah, something that crew reminds me though is that you know, when it's warm, it's fine. When it's cold, it's fine. It's when we get these freeze-thaw cycles, it's tough, and that's what we're gonna see more of. So, proposing an increase there, because I think we're gonna, you know, every year is gonna be different, but we're not likely to go down. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any results yet on this uh, experiment of uh, not using salt and uh... um, I haven't heard any complaints. We got, we actually got, sorry, we got one complaint from someone about it but he was out in Waterbury Center and he thought we weren't salting his road. And we were. But you were salting. <laughs> Just, that Just the road was the road. Um, I've driven around a few times and I haven't seen salt where they're not supposed to put it. Um, they came back and they said to me, you know, the Ice Center Road, um, sorry, is that River Road, <coughs> was one of the roads on the list. And they came back and they said, you know, we'd like to salt it to Rodney's. Um, just because there's a lot of traffic there. Mm -hmm. 200 feet there. And I said, I think we're fine, go go forth and conquer. Um, but, but in general, I, you know, the, they seem to be following it. And we've, we've also told them if there's a significant ice event, you know, you've got some discretion to go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Going back to uh, diesel, I know we talked about possibly getting a tandem, you know, dump and, yep. you know, you know, they'd be running back and forth. Wouldn't that create then an increase in diesel cost? That would, um, but so we do that now already. We have one person who does a lot of that right. with the tandem. So we'll probably come to the spring, come to you this spring with the request to order a vehicle subject to either select order vote or approval a year from now when we have to pay for it, if we're lucky a year from now. And we're, we're, we've had some conversations about getting getting a tandem versus a smaller vehicle or, or contracting all that out. So this would probably be a cost <coughs> in the following fiscal year. Yeah, I'm not really set on what we're going to do there, but yeah, that cost wouldn't hit us probably until not even the following fiscal year, but two years, because it's going to be a year to order the truck, a year yeah. to get it, and then a year to drive it. So, and maybe by then we'll have some other options that are a little better. Okay. And, the, and one of the challenges is we talked about um, the, the tandems they want to get um, when the manufacturers are switching engines. And so there's, um, you actually can't get a price on <coughs> it. So not only can you not order it, but so you know, there's more than one manufacturer, but um, you know, we think probably in a few months we'll have some, some proposal for you to consider. But we, we ordered the truck, to give you an example, we ordered a one ton before my time last year. It arrived, um, what, four or five months ago? Just, just the chassis. Um, I was originally told uh, by Celia that um, we thought they felt they were going to get it in, get the body done, and put on um, around Christmas. And now they're thinking they'll take the truck in end of January and have it back to us a month later, something like that. So that was something like an 18-month lead time. That's that's what we're facing. And that's the third year in a row that <coughs> scenario has oh. happened with trucks that we buy. So it's not. It's. So oh, it's that's right. You got to. You've got to order it and and then subject to approval. <coughs> the company won't ever have a problem selling the truck if you cancel yes. it if it's not funded by the voters because everybody wants a truck. So it's it's not a risk, but it is standard operating procedure of life. Yeah, and a, and a tandem is. Um, I don't want to wait for a gas. The one ton with the bed is 150, 155. I think the tandem is over two. So it's a pretty expensive proposition. But Perhaps by that time we'll have a local option tax and that can soften the blow too on some of these things. They haven't gotten to the point where like those tandem <coughs> trucks are electric yet. Um, I haven't last. seen anything bigger than the F-150. Yeah, line. well that's what I'm saying. I know even that's gone up in price today. But, you know, that's probably the future of all these heavy equipment trucks are all going to become electric. I, I don't know. I mean, they have electric school buses. Exactly. They're not carrying a heavy load. Uh, they're carrying some kids. But. Mm -hmm. Phil, you have a minute? Yeah, just a question, Tom, on line 46 here, and I know we talked a little bit about it yesterday, the public works director. Is that just a placeholder now? It's just a placeholder. That that, that's change a little that's bit. That's a number that's... The, the number that was budgeted for 2023 was an exact number, because it always was retrospectively what yeah. the town owed you thought. And I noticed throughout the budget that it's all the same. So yeah, it's just a placeholder for We just don't have the numbers yet. So those will change a little bit. Thanks. But those shouldn't be meaningful in terms of impacting the tax rate in a, in a big way. Mm -hmm. It's right. going to be, you know, some might be up, some might be down. The net basis is probably pretty small. Um, the, the, let the record show you said the public works director is not meaningful. <laughs> 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 it's all right. I mean, my heat's not out of my own. So <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, nice to <laughs> the, the biggest piece, perhaps, um, is you know, line 66 will be sent to the capital fund. 2023 it was a real big number because we had a bunch of ARPA funds in there. Not all, not all the ARPA projects were completed, but I, I don't want to reappropriate the expense on the revenue in the second year in a row. It's, it's in the budget this year. It'll 
we can still do the project, the fund, the, the cash is still there. Um, it stays, it's been sent to the capital fund, it stays in the capital fund. Mm -hmm. But if you turn the page to the capital fund, mm -hmm. so we had a conversation a little over a year ago about consolidating the capital funds. Um, <coughs> so in this budget, all the capital funds are not consolidated into one, but there was um, several for public works that are consolidated into one. Um, and the revenue is what we transfer in. So essentially that, that 595 is just tax dollars going in there. Um, the paving budget in total is up $45,000, which I think is a good increase. I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to be in front of you a year from now saying we have a local option tax, let's have a paving budget of three quarter million dollars um, or something along those lines. Um, why, if you just explain why our building budget's going up 45,000 bucks? So the, the price per ton of blacktop has gone up pretty substantially um, in the last five years, even higher than the base rate of inflation, in fact, probably close to that. So even a 10% increase in our paving means we're paving less than we were a few years ago. So we need to have, you know, I think we probably need to be in the range of, now we've been level funded at the at roughly 440 for a few years now, so we really probably need to go another 50 or more to, to be to keep pace with the inflation costs. But it's nice to nice to see the increase. I'm curious, and this likely is a bigger discussion. That's not just a budget discussion, but thinking about you know our December mud season, which was possibly worse than some April mud seasons mm -hmm. I've seen. What are the conversations like? Um, or should we start putting conversations on our agendas about <clears throat> what that's going to require? Because um, I know public works worked really hard this month and did an amazing job, but it was, uh, you know, that's the future ongoing. That's the future. Um, <clears throat> we certainly can't realistically plan to pay for that. Mm. Um, but I think we can realistically look at our worst areas and consider extending paving where appropriate you know something we had that conversation internally and something woody and Celia talked about was um the end of Newland flats um where it turns into ripley in the curve Going up the hill, so we like to we like to pave i believe it's a few hundred feet there yeah. it's not a, not a huge amount and they think the the sub base and the road is in pretty good shape so we don't need to do a whole lot of prep work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's sections like that, that that we can we can address year to year. But no, I mean, I asked Woody, I think this morning, I said, if we if we just give me a ballpark number, I won't hold you to it. Now I will because we're in public. But <laughs> I said if we had to just you know, fall in, pay if, if we were going to pave our gravel roads, what's the what's the cost? And he said, you know, half mil, a mile, something like that. And we've got I think 29 miles of 29 miles of gravel roads. <laughs> so it's a it's an awful big number. Mm -hmm. um, probably too big for us to consider. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not too big to consider certain patches and extending the worst areas. Um, I've had, I haven't had Woody tell me this, I haven't had this conversation with him, but I've had other, work, public, other public works directors tell me that, you know, it's tempting to pave a hill on a gravel road where it's always bad, but it doesn't work so well when you're doing a stretch of gravel and a stretch of pavement, um, just more trouble than it's worth in the long run. Mm -hmm. What he might feel differently, and I'm open to an expert opinion on that. <laughs> um, so I think our future might be to do um, a little more paving in the gravel roads year to year, but but it's not um, not really going to be so much a long term plan. It's just dealing with the most challenging areas. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe the town manager doesn't live on the road anymore. Chris, you had your hand up. Well, yeah. Um, a few years back there when I was in the, on the board, and maybe some of you have heard this before, I uh, threw out some numbers on what it would take us uh, for a paving budget to keep up with a seven-year cycle. Mm -hmm. um, even a 10-year cycle at this point, we're about a third of what we need uh, to keep up with that. Um, I don't, a lot of you probably don't pay attention to the roads that are, I mean, that's my life, that's my business. Uh, Perry Hill is, 
starting to show some very big signs of degradation. The asphalt's really starting to bust up pretty good, especially on the steep hill. Neilan Flats, we've missed that window to, if we haven't missed it, we're damn near missing it to do a simple repave on that. That's, that's uh, the plan for next year to the mill and then. Guptal Road's way overdue. Uh, uh, you know, Barnes Hill, the base up there at the top of, the sub base up on the top of Barnes Hill is horrible at best. Um, that doesn't even be, begin to address our dirt roads. Um, I'm still trying to find an inroad on that quarry up on Sweet Road because I think that's the key to our back road, our dirt road solutions. Uh, to put a decent base down with some of that busted rock, fractured rock, and then put some decent material over it, giving it some drain, drainable sub base to keep the mud from percolating to the top, the water from percolating to the top. I've done it on a couple other roads uh, and had <coughs> spectacular um, results with it. It completely eliminates mud. But first, you've got to have a source of aggregate to use. So um, we can continue to throw gobs of money at dumping gravel into mud and ending up with mud, continually ending up with mud, or we can try to come up with another solution. And, you know, I'm going to do my part to try to <coughs> see if I can't get that quarry to come to the table. Uh, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. And the quarry that you're operating now doesn't have sufficient quantities of gravel? It has sufficient quantities of gravel. Um, you know, we can have a conversation about that at some point. Um, yeah, there's a couple different approaches of how some of that aggregate could get used. It doesn't have to go through a crushing process. We could use some of it as a base to absorb some of the cost. Um, and then put a, a thinner top coat on it. Uh, it's incredible gravel. There's three different types of gravel there that, that are available. But it still, is, it still is not giving, giving you the drainable base that you, that you really need in order to stay out of the mud. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll take you up on that for the conversation. Um, going down a little further, there is uh, 30000 in the budget for sidewalks that is not, um, that is not grant funded, that is not the finalization of the Main Street project, that is um, sidewalks, potentially some, some curbing, um, you know, there's some areas, um, especially around the school, where there's some older sidewalks, um, so I think pecking away at it each year is, a, is an okay approach. We get a really good price if we did a five million dollar bond and did every sidewalk in, in the village, but I think we're going to get the worst of it each year, and it's pretty economical. Um, did we get state funding for the the, the Randall Street sidewalks, yeah. and that's not available any longer? The project is ending. There's a few dangling participles. What is wrapping up? But. Mm -hmm. It's part of the downtown. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, now that Main Street's done, Randall, Elm, and Park will be part of this next phase of that downtown. Um, what we can get, yeah, it was a grant. Karen Nevin basically is your heading. There's downtown money. The downtown, yeah. There's hmm? downtown money available every year, but you know you can apply. But if you received a two hundred thousand dollar grant in the recent past yeah, we'll usually turn for the next we'll usually find some of the else that will yeah. need it. But you should it's a source of revenue that you should always look at in terms yeah, of right. things that any, any source of revenue like yeah, you were saying cool. earlier it's part of patchwork, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um and then there's seventy five thousand dollars for bridge improvements. That's a still street bridge. That's a state project, but we have a five percent share. Mm -hmm. Our five percent share is one hundred ninety five thousand. So we spent some of that already. We get invoices essentially when they invoice us. So in essence, over based on what we spent already in the next few years, we'll, we'll put one hundred ninety five thousand dollars into the capital budget for that. It's a little hard to know the timing of the bills. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, the capital fund is this odd thing where some years it's 
deep in the red and some years it's deep in the black because you know this year you might put a bunch of money into it for a truck but you don't pay the bill for two years so you just got to manage it for the long term mm -hmm. and this is one of those issues a bit like a truck and that the bills are going to come in mm -hmm. and this is the, the upper bridge <coughs> on Stowe Street yeah. yeah and then can you say that we have problems with the bridge down underneath the trestle here uh, yes but I am um And that will be a town project, in all likelihood. Um, I mean, when we get closer, I'm sure we'll aggressively apply for grants there, but we don't want to do that bridge while the other way, way through is under construction. Right, right. Uh, That's uh, not uh, a part of the state highway. <coughs> it was not part of the, the Main Street grant bill right. alluded to. It was just outside. It's not in our designated downtown. Right. Um, I'm. I think it's a state highway, <coughs> so the state responsibility. Oh, I'm actually, due to the Stanley Watson parcel and potentially this, I'm, I'm going to work on actively amending the boundaries of the designated downtown. And so that might make some funding available. Um, I don't have a number for what that bridge will cost. We've, we've priced it out a couple different times, and <coughs> it tried to get it lumped into the Main Street project. That couldn't happen, and it was an opportune to do it during all that because it would have made a mess. Um, and as far as real priorities, Bridge 36 at the top of Stowe Street is probably, let's not upset the state too much, yeah. let them do that project. Yeah. They're also doing Route 2 <coughs> which, uh, by Little River, yeah. let them get that one done, and then I think we can yeah. focus on that. And then it may be, um, we've had conversations with the state about hazard mitigation grants um, related to flooding generally, and what they've said is, don't apply five times or five projects, apply once. And I wonder if that bridge mm. potentially could be part of a project. I'm, I'm not the engineer. I don't, don't have any vision for what could be different. But um, if there's a better option that would help out in terms of the flooding, even, just, even though we haven't had real damage to that bridge, um, if there's some potential, they might help us out in, in some mm -hmm. redesign. What is the defect in that bridge? It, it's just mm -hmm. the decks, the beams, the you know yeah, the basic the repair way. work we do to a bridge. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the this this <coughs> the state bureaucracy is it's just unbelievable. I mean, when the roundabout was done, when the roundabout was done, we were able to do like two two beams of that bridge, but we couldn't do the whole bridge as part of that. That project. <laughs> only only a quarter of a qualified sidewalk, <coughs> and then the Main Street project comes in, and it's right, you know, 50 yeah. feet from the end of the Main Street project, and we couldn't do that bridge because, oh, if we added that bridge, then you're going to be over the limit that would trigger Act 250 to look at the whole project. So they said, please don't ask us to do the bridge, and and that's what. Tom and Bill have to face nowadays. And I don't have to get educated about it. <laughs> 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 um, so it's a lot of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. I just have one quick question. Sure. Just from my notes, when is the Stowe Street Bridge project scheduled? 2025. Right. For construction. For construction. For so there is a little bridge work. We have been doing some on Guppel Road, and we did the Armory Drive, Bridge 33, last year. Yep. Um, <coughs> painting the beams, greasing the beams, deck work, sidewalk work on Armory Bridge 33. We'd like to do some work on bridge number four on Guppel Road. That is the bridge just before Nealon Flats uh, by Dr. Murray's driveway. Yep. So if you count the bridges as you go out from Guppel Road, you won't come to four. And if you count them the other way, you won't come to four. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the bridge by Chris's driveway is bridge three. Uh, uh, the bridge by Grenier's is bridge two. Um, so, oh, that's helpful. <laughs> yes, very helpful. So if you're trying to figure out where bridge four is, it's not where you think it is. Um, but we've got about $200,000 worth of work there if you choose to do, want to do something like that. That's bridge deck repair, um, railing, guardrail, um, approaches. That bridge has a, I think it's called a spill through abutment. So as Chris probably can attest, you hit the whoop every time you go over that bridge. Love it. Love it. So, um, we correct that. So we've got prices to do that. 
and a contractor lined up. If we'd like to go that route, it's about a 10 week project, uh, single lane traffic all summer there or whatever, but. Um, what was is, that, is that the bridge next to the cow pasture? It's right before Neil and Flax. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was 200 project. Two, I think you said 200,000? 218 or something like that, okay. yeah. Yeah, and the other two bridges were ARPA. So even though they're not done yet, the ARPA funds stay in the capital budget. Uh -huh. So they'll be completed with the ARPA funds. Okay, and, well, and the <coughs> other two are scheduled this year? Or? So Armory Drive is done. Done. And then the, I don't want to say if it's bridge two, three, or four, <laughs> in Guptal, but the Guptal Road Bridge is, is yeah. going to happen this year. Yeah, the bridge four, <coughs> and we priced out, yeah, we priced out all our bridges, but yes, I think the next needed is bridge four. Yeah. Okay. And did you, is that covered in the do you have it in the budget now? Or that was in the budget for last year. For it was in the budget. Yeah, so we had 495 for, I believe 495 in our budget for bridges last year. I think that covered so three different <laughs> projects, and we got one of them done. Yeah. So the money stays in the capital fund. Okay. So we, we you can you can do it either way. Some towns, if it's not spent, will essentially reappropriate the revenue and reappropriate the expense to, to show it differently. But mm -hmm. it's been approved by the board. The budget's been approved. We'll we'll get it done. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make a do it now joke, but I'm doing <laughs> where in your spreadsheet. But half the challenge and is with the capital fund is you you can you can give us another million bucks. I'm not sure we can always spend it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can spend it on paving usually because there's a pretty good supply of paving contractors and plenty of projects, but there's fewer companies that do bridge work and you need sometimes a pretty long lead time. And that's just the challenge I have. Okay. So is that, is that bridge on up till next on the docket? It, yes. Yeah, right. Right. The contractor would start uh, end of April if available. <coughs> but remember too the challenge to some of the paving projects Tom, I'm sorry you can probably get the paving contractors to be available to do paving but if you have to change culverts on the road before you do a paving project prep work that we typically do then that you know so that's been part of the bottleneck in terms of doing more paving over the time if you could just go out and pave the road fairly easy, but if you got to change all the culverts and you've got to deal with the shoulders and the ditches, and you're going to do that yourself, your staff can only do so much in a year. So it, you know, there's a lot of challenges to, yeah. to all these things. And the sidewalks are another good example of that. Now, last summer we had more or less a third of the public works crew devoted to parks and cemetery maintenance. Um, we then had a period in the summer where our match for the grant was that we would pull the sidewalks with our own crew. And that took them off of road work for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So it was good financially in that perspective, but um, sometimes it's just easier if you can call the contractor. Right. Yeah. Um, can I ask a real quick question about sidewalks? Yeah, sure. Um, Woody, is the town still using foam under all our sidewalks? We have been, yes. And are we seeing a return on investment with, with like less heaving of our sidewalks due to, the, due to that? Um, I would say we're not seeing any heaving. What we do see a lot of is the areas that approach, so your driveway approach and your street driveway approach um, behave a lot differently than what's on the yeah. Different elevations? Yeah, yeah, we'll get quite a bit of frost under those spots. Uh, but for the most part, the sidewalks themselves are staying pretty correct. consistent. Correct. I, I guess you can't have it, you know, 100% perfect. But. No, no. Um, and it's it's difficult to understand why some driveways will heave yeah. a few inches and some won't move at all. Different soil types. Yeah. Moisture content. The more moisture, the bigger the heave. Yeah. <coughs> And then there is a little money in the capital fund and I consider it almost base amount you put in each year. Um, maybe they should go up um, for culverts and then a sim the same amount for building improvements and that's public works garage. <coughs> um, there's always some money spent in the garage. A lot of that again depends on the time they have to do it. Um, 
and culverts are, are one of those things. Um, sometimes they tend to run into a, a you know, they're confronted with a culvert at these three ways where it wasn't necessarily anticipated. Um, mm -hmm. There is a big culvert being re that was replaced as part of the water line project. Um, that's a $42,000 culvert. Oh, on, up on Kennedy Drive? Yeah, but that's paid for by a grant. Oh. So that's something we did this year. Is it true that uh, we're having to put in larger culverts because we've got more water? Uh, or we we are really under designed? We're required when we change out any culvert larger than three foot in diameter to do a hydraulic study, um, which basically <coughs> always comes back saying we need to do it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, one on Tom mentioned on Ashford Lane, Kennedy Drive area, you know, there were limitations with water and sewer lines. We couldn't go bigger. We went bigger, but mm -hmm. to, yeah, you yeah. Could, as long as you could go. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of culverts, is that big major wildlife passage, is that within Waterbury? Then? It's in the town of Waterbury. <coughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Where does that stand? Do you know where that, that that's still preliminary? Preliminary, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I assume it's going to be. And all state funds, I Yeah, assume. state and federal, yeah. We're talking about going over or under Route 100? Under. Under. Big, big, up on top of the hill. Big Route 2. Route 2. Oh, 2. Just right. by the Bolton Town line. Right. right. Okay. A big, massive culvert that we're looking at doing. Kind of similar what they did out in St. Johnsbury, that cow passage. Sim that day. You going to give them swimming lessons too? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, no, this is a big, pretty... significant dam right below there. <laughs> yeah. It'd be problematic. Right. I'm sure that. But um, that's that's public works. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think the big issue is um, getting some agreement between the town need but about the hire. Right. Uh, it sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, I, I, I congratulate you on finding a uh, solution. I didn't, I didn't find them. Yeah. Well, you came up with the idea. I thought about it. Thought about no, I didn't come up with the idea either. Oh, you thought it would? I tried to find play a soccer. Oh, that's why he's so good. Well, it would be nice to hire somebody who was born in this century. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and he's a. He, He's a really good kid, but the problem is I'm hiring another firefighter, which I've already been informed that uh, Christmas party night, I'm on call. You're on call. Because all, your, all my guys are at the party. Because I'll probably have one here. Yeah, so. Other than that, young people. Yeah, so no, I think it, uh, adding him would be a nice move. He's a good kid. He's a phenomenal kid. Yeah. yeah. I think the biggest issue would just be figuring out, you know, the distribution of labor and Mm -hmm. yeah. everyone. Okay. Uh, and, but then, in terms of the capital budget, you don't. Uh, is there any big decision that uh, we need to be weighing? Uh, the, the the big decision, I think, um, boils down to your comfort with the tax rate, um, because there's a lot of money in the capital budget. Um, so if you, um, you know, if you feel like, for example. Um, The sidewalks are not imperative, and that's a thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollar appropriation into the budget. Um, that's now there's some bad sidewalks. Um, there are not any outstanding lawsuits related to it. Um, it'd be nice to do them over time, but it, it's not it's not as high a priority as some other things. Um, but if you if we needed to find money, I would probably tell you the sidewalks would be an option. We could. We could reduce. We could, I wouldn't tell you to reduce it because it's a small amount already, given given the cost of doing sidewalks. So I'd probably tell you to um, I'd probably tell you to cut it to zero, and then we'll come back in future years with a plan. Because okay. we will be doing the Park <coughs> Row sidewalks. Part of the have to the project. Part of the grant. Mm -hmm. so, even though the Park Row sidewalk is in decent shape. Yeah, it's in pretty good shape. Yeah. We fought that battle, but mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Elm Street. Uh, I'd like to do Elm Street as well. Yeah. They, they, we wanted to do Elm instead of Park, mm. but the state was not. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elm Street actually yeah. was yeah. the yeah. Park Street, Park Street one or Park Row one connects you to the park in the more to the. Oh yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. we, I think we can still do both of them, but. 
Just Park Row side, not the other side, Park Street, right? Yeah. Yes, just yeah. Park Row West. Yeah. Yeah. And Tom, in answer to your question, I am uh, I congratulate you on uh, the budget you developed. I am uh, reasonably comfortable with the the increases that you put in here. Uh, I don't think a cent and a half is, is extraordinary given the. Uh, uh, experience of inflation that we've endured over the past uh, several years. Um, what I'm really concerned about is the school taxes and mm -hmm. how much increase that's going to be because all of that combines into a big hit on, on our townspeople. And uh, so, you know, we may end up having to tighten our belts because of the schools, which doesn't sound fair to me, but uh, it's it's a hit. I guess. Um, unless there's questions, we can move on to fire. Yeah. 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 Based on what I just heard from the chair saying that the overall budget looks good, do you have any final questions? <laughs> yeah, do you need any more trucks? Yeah. 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 That is on my list. That truck. Yeah. Okay, it is on my list. Uh, so I can go down through. So a lot of the budget that you have, the insurance and stuff, I don't do anything with because there's nothing that I can do with that. That's a municipality thing. I can go down and just hit some of the highlights under the stuff that I can control. And if you have questions, uh, certainly throw them out. I have some brief discussions about apparatus and how I will work with Tom and make some adjustments. Um, Let me just hit on the revenue real quick. Sure. Yeah, let's uh, cover revenue and then so the that's, expenses. And that's any, based on... Particularly significant changes from what we've done in the past. So the Duxbury Fire Contract is based on our expenses for 2023. Um, and they pay a portion of it. And I'm going to... And it's formulaic, it's been in place for some time. Um, but essentially, it's based on the portion of the grand list they cover and a ratio of that to the town's grand list. The challenge is our grand list is growing faster than theirs. And it doesn't mean a hill of beans in any one year, but, but over a few years, it, it means a little bit. And so I'm, I'm likely to send them a letter saying, same methodology as prior years, but 2025, we're going to have to do something a little differently because over time it's it's not a lot of money, but a thousand bucks is a lot of money to me. Um, but the, por the portion of their town that it covers just the grand the grand list of that portion just isn't really moving much compared to ours, and our grand list tends to grow about a percent a year. So not a huge thing. It's you know there's my growth well, half a percent. Well, it's me percent. talking about an increase of well, over six thousand dollars. Well, that's based on our prior year cost, but if if our grand list keeps growing faster than theirs, um, mm -hmm. it would be skewed a little bit, and it wouldn't grow as fast as it should. On the contrary, their grand list could also grow faster than ours. So, that at some point, I'm just going to think about a slightly different, a slight change in methodology, and maybe just say, let's peg it at where it is now and grow it, maybe not by the grand list, but by the rate of inflation. Um, mm -hmm. That way, it's it's just set and simple. For Duxbury and Moortown, Gary, mm -hmm. um, the amount that we get from them on a per call basis, oh, oh, are we don't, covering our expenses? We don't do it based on per call. Well, uh, but if we were going to, you're asking if we were to do it that way, does right. it? Right. You know, I, I don't know. Um, and every call is different. Uh, we could, right. Last week we went to. Uh, a reported crash, and all it was is a car that slid off the road. But we had three trucks on the way. Or we could have a house fire, and um, you still have three trucks, and then you call in more mutual aid. So it, it, I guess I haven't really looked at that as opposed to the current system. You know, are we going to pay per call? And then we'd have to calculate what's the value of the truck, what's the, right. the cost of the Firefighters, um, so there, there would be a fair amount of work to not, not that it can't be overcome. 
but we, we might go a long time without a calling dumpster at all. And then we shoot up Camel Sumper across a hill you know, two or three times in a week. Sorry. Hmm. Uh, we don't shoot up any of those hills, actually. <laughs> <laughs> In terminology, there is no way to sh shoot up any of those roads, but it's a long ways up some of them. Uh, so I, I'm not vested one way or the other, quite honestly. Okay. If you wanted to, to go towards a paid per call basis. Um, but you can't, I mean, we're talking about uh, projections in the future. You have no idea how not many calls you're going to have. Not a clue. I guess you can look at how many calls you've had over the past couple of years. And, now, and that I... sometimes is skewed, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then, especially the crashes, you know, a lot of them don't turn out to be crashes. And then are we going to charge Duxbury? I'm just throwing this out. So if somebody goes off the road. They're not hurt. They don't call 911. Somebody else sees it, doesn't want to stop because they're too busy. They call 911. We have to go. Mm -hmm. And are you going to charge Duxbury for that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. that's what you'd be getting into. And then the challenge is every year, um, you know, our budget gets really bumpy. If we did it on a per call basis, um, some of that it to the actual calls, you know, mm -hmm. it might be. 121 year and he did the next and 175 right. right. Yeah. So, yeah, and I would think happened. they would want to have a you know pretty static way of paying it's a it's good for service. It's more like an insurance program. Right. right. You're covered, you got a problem with fire, they're covered by uh whatever right. and due to this contract. <clears throat> Duxbury still has to have a 911 call taker sitting there. They're answering other calls. But that person has to be there. You have to have the dispatcher in Montpelier sitting there. Now, they're doing other things. But in part, their job is to take care of Duxbury through Waterbury. So all those pieces have to be in place uh, for every call. And don't forget, it's it's a pretty good deal. An eighth of our budget is paid for by another town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there going to be anticipating any uh, issues with Duxbury uh, fulfilling this contract? Um, I don't think so. They didn't have any questions last year. It's a bigger increase than it's been lately, but it's based on our actuals. If they um, if they have a problem, um, they just they would notify us in advance of the budget. So. Okay. Um, I expect they won't like the increase. Um, you know, I'll give them the, the actual number when I get a little closer to having it. Um, and what we've historically done is once we get, you know, not quite the first week of January, but we get try to make sure we get lingering invoices. We bill them using the formula based on the actual, and then we also say if a, you know if an odd invoice comes in between now and this letter, then that's not part of it because we've already given you a set number. Um, it's a pretty fair way to do it, I think. Um, you know, they might not love it, but I think it's pretty fair. And I think given given inflation, um, you know, it was a hundred. It was higher in 2021 than it was in 2023. So we're not in the long term going up that much. Okay. We should go on to expenditures. Sure. On the on the pay side. Um, Pay was the pay in 2023 is over budget, um, but a substantial part of that was flood relief. Mm -hmm. A substantial part of that will be reimbursed by FEMA. So um, 2024 really takes out takes out the flood part of it. Um, it is still up, despite that. Um, <coughs> that's good. That means our volunteer ranks are healthy, um, and I also factored in. Um, you know the same the same base uh, four percent for all people. I'm also proposing to give to the fire to the fire crew. I don't see why they should be treated different. I know they're, they're volunteers, but yeah, I still think that makes sense. Um, and then the rest of the budget, um, the, the dispatching piece is is worth a little conversation. That's the that's the Capital West. Um, I guess I'll call it a consortium that we're part of. Um, and that increase is, is based on um, 
you know, in essence, their capital plan and our portion of that, and that was presented last year. We can have them in if you feel like that's necessary, but really what they're doing is, is they're executing the plan. Um, and the dispatch cost, um, I went and looked at um, other towns, and there's only a few regional dispatch centers in the state, but you know, the simple way to break it down is on a per capita basis, and a lot of towns are built that way, and that's a pretty reasonable number. Um, you know, less than 20 bucks per capita. Or just it's a barn. <coughs> What's that? It's a barn. Oh, it's a, yeah, Bill's absolutely right. <coughs> what we're paying compared to other dispatch centers, um, we're getting a really good deal. Um, there are other places we could go. There's one that the neighboring department in Chittenden County uses, but all they do is tone you out. That is it. They provide no real dispatch service. And, you know, if we have somebody in our off in our radio room when we have a call, either one of them, um, and we need to get a hold of Green Mountain Power, we'll try and, especially when there's a storm, mm -hmm. the dispatchers in Montpelier are busy. So we will try and handle that ourselves. There's a couple of us that have access to Green Mountain Power's emergency line. They don't like that being out there, but they've given it to a couple of us. So we try and handle that internally. But... If we need to have multiplayer call, they will, because that's part of their job. If we wanted to go cheaper, we get cheaper. Mm -hmm. And it's not good, mm -hmm. in my mind. We're too busy, you know, if you have 50, 60 calls a year, you can say, okay, all we want is somebody to take that just out, but that's not water. Uh, our call volume has gone up this year. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's like 235. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big jump over last year. And you know, for many years, we went down. We are 343 a number of years ago was our high. And then after that, we dropped and dropped until we were significantly under 100 calls, uh, under 200 calls. And now we're starting to go back up again. How much of that is the highway? Not a big percentage. During a, not during the storm, people actually, use their heads a little bit during the storm, but it's when they start clearing the interstate and the sides are still full of snow and they start picking up speed, that's when we start going. Um, they, but it's not a big percentage. Uh, I, I haven't run the stats yet for last year. That's maybe this weekend. Um, Do you have any idea why the calls are going up? No, there's nothing specific that I can point to, just like there was nothing specific that I could point to why they were going down. Just the way. Uh, you know. Well, they went down before there a big time because we have a lot less chimney fires than we used well, to. Well, yeah. So we used to have, when I started forever ago, um, we used to have like 20, 30 chimney fires a year. And now we might have five or six. It's, it's very small. And what the state does now on the interstates, which is very helpful, a little less so in the Middlesex district, um, is they pre coat the roads. And that With helps. The, the wet, the wet the 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 Right. Um, it's, it's not good for your car, <coughs> but it's good for crashes. So there's a trade off. Uh, um, and that helps us until after the storm and people pick up speed because. The main lanes on the interstate are clear, but then they cut over the fog line and they get caught up in it, and that's when they crash. Mm -hmm. And Roger, back to dispatching too, just remember that the dispatching cost that we pay includes the dispatching for Wasi. Right. right. Um, Going further down, there's a there's a big number, um, 87,850 for new equipment. Um, it's a large number. It's consistent with prior years. Um, Gary's got um, a long list of items he reviewed with me, and he's done that in prior years. Um, you know, some fire departments, you you look at other towns and you see 20 more white items for hoses and 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 you know boots and, and the protective gear, and that's essentially all that is in here. <laughs> Um, and in 2023, Gary presented me the plan and basically bought everything on it once it was approved. Uh, so the budget was 
more or less to the penny. Um, prices all in advance. Some of his some of his other staff help with that. Um, I didn't want to present that level of detail. I think it would be more effective if people want that that we should tour the department in a meeting and, and go through and see some of it. Yeah, I, I don't know. Has everybody here been into the fire station? Has actually looked around? Because I, I, I think you might be a, a little surprised as to what a truck, which truck does what. Um, and, you know, looking right now in, in the new equipment is a PPE dryer. That's a gear dryer. So what we have been doing for a number of years <coughs> has been putting in a washing machine. We stopped doing that because it's just a washing machine. And we bought extractors there. Uh, washing machines on steroids it actually extracts all the crap that causes cancer out of the gear. Uh, so we have those, but then we still have to put them on the back of a chair to dry. And then when you have another call, you're either, that person's not going, or they're taking somebody else's gear, and if that person shows up, they're cranky because their gear's gone. So uh, having these dryers will actually literally, it's not going to solve the problem. It's the solution to the problem in solving it is having two sets of gear. Uh, I don't see that necessarily happening. There are departments that do that, uh, but I don't see us doing that. We have some people that have uh, redundant gear. Like I have a set in Waterbury Center. Um, we have a couple people that work up there, live down here, that might have a duplicate set because they're going to respond here for a call. So, uh, but the, the dryers, we can actually put the, it's kind of like a skeleton. You just put the gear on it and it, you turn on the dryers and it dries the gear with just ambient room temperature air. You're not supposed to use a dryer as an example because that uh, degrades the, the gear. We found that out many years ago in the station down here when we had gear hanging along the wall and the sun was coming in and we found out that we, we literally grabbed it because it looked discolored. We grabbed it and just pulled it apart. So you, there's, there's some things you just can't do. Yeah. Uh, well, in answer to your question, I'd be uh, game for a tour of the, the department uh, mm -hmm. if you wanted to set up a time. Uh, yeah. Maybe an educational firm. Or... Sure. I get, I get amazed because I approve a lot of the warrants and just looking at how much some of the equipment costs, yeah, it just okay. it blows your mind. Well, what's it cost? It's all expensive. Rough numbers. What's it cost to outfit a new firefighter? So a helmet is in the area of three fifty. Gloves are like a hundred seven five hundred bucks. Yep, yeah, gloves are about eighty five. A coat is sixteen hundred. Uh, pants are a little less. They're about nine hundred. The hood is about sixty five. Uh, it's a Nomex or other similar material that keeps people from getting burned. Uh, so in, in the boots, um, they're expensive. They're about $450. So, yeah. And, and how, what's the expected, expected life of a set of gear? Depends on who you are. And, and I say that because some members are there more often. Uh, <coughs> You take uh, Stan Morris as an example, or my wife. They're there on a more regular basis, and uh, Kyle Gaia is there on a more regular basis. But they're also uh, aggressive interior firefighters that are going to wear that gear out more. So the life, ex the life of the gear, if it's not damaged, is 10 years. If we get to, if, if the gear is two years old and it gets damaged, we send it in, they will fix it uh, in a, the manner that is prescribed. If it gets to like year seven or eight, it really isn't worth the cost to fix that gear when you're gonna replace it in a couple of years. Because it's still expensive because they have to do things in a manner that is still gonna protect the firefighter. But those people you might get uh, eight years out of, some of the others will get the full 10 years. Mine, uh, I try not to get dirty. <laughs> but I go on mutual aid calls, and every once in a while, I get to put an air pack on and actually play firefighter. Um,
but you know, it, it, we have a, our equipment officer. He has everything on a spreadsheet. And once a year, he updates his spreadsheet, who has what. And the year before that person's gear is due to expire, that line or that item shows yellow. The year that it has to be replaced pops up red. Those are the people we, we have to get gear for. Uh, so he's got a real good handle on that. I don't even worry about it. He comes to me when it's time to get gear. He's already called the vendor. The vendor comes in, gives him the prices for each of the stuff, and he knows how much we have in that line item, and then he consults with me, and we place the order. Uh, I don't have to get into it. Yeah, I just want to thank past select boards in the community for supporting this budget. Um, the fire department has the highest ISO rating that any volunteer fire department can have. Uh, part of that is due to the good water system that we thought in the village had invested in. But uh, the reason why we have 50 volunteer firefighters is because we invest in good equipment, good vehicles, and, and provide good training to these people. You can, you know, Duxbury gets part of their fire coverage from Moortown for the part of uh, Duxbury that's on the other side. I'm not, I'm not here to disparage Moortown, but you, you, you'd be happier if you were being covered by the water the water department by, than by the Moortown Fire Department. You can go around the state and look at volunteer fire departments, and I would put ours up against any. And it's, it's cheap insurance, and you have the department you have because the community's been willing to invest the money in it. And I hope that you do it again. Thanks. Yeah, we have lost uh, firefighters to full-time departments, and one to South Burlington. He, can, he decided to move outside the area, but he could have stayed here and been on our department. The one department, full-time department in Vermont that does not allow their firefighters to be on other departments is Burlington. You know, they have their own uh, stuff to do. And it's an issue between the city and uh, the union. But we've lost five people to Burlington. Five really good firefighters. And it's because, you know, I had a, a deputy chief who I know, and he says, well, we won't take them if you'd stop training them. <laughs> Hmm. So, you know, <laughs> they got to pay us for the training. Yeah, <laughs> that would be that'd be great. Uh, we burned a building for training that belonged to Ben and Jerry's, and their training officer came down with their recruit class because they trusted in the systems that we use. So, yeah, I, I think we run a, a, a good department. I have great officers that run the department. I, I'm just kind of the figurehead, um, but we have some really great training. We have some really great officers that like to teach people stuff. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. I mean, we have one of the best uh, <coughs> heavy rescue um, trainings around the state. Uh, Spencer Morris, who just recently passed away, started it in 1972. Uh, his funeral is this Saturday. But he started it, and it carried on. Somebody else's father was directly involved taught me, um, but we, we've learned some, from some really good people and we've trained a lot of really good people. But if you want to join, I'm happy to take you. <laughs> well, I'll join you for a tour. Maybe uh, <laughs> <laughs> see right, what they the, really I'll want the bottle services uh, after that. So you just let me know, I, I'm certainly available and, and I've offered it up in the past. We do our training the second and the fourth <coughs> Tuesdays. Um, if you are available and you want to come, I would, I would ask that you call me and not show up because you don't want to sit there if we're running just some uh, in-house training like CPR refresher uh, that we have to do. But, mm -hmm. you know, I would love to have you come out. I know you've got rules around that, but you could come out <coughs> periodically and, and see what it is that we actually do. Okay. It's your department. And then thank you for what you do. It's a pleasure. We don't have to finalize it today, but we, we ordered the truck 
with your approval earlier. Mm -hmm. So I believe our last meeting in January is our deadline for finalizing the warning. Mm -hmm. So we'll have we'll have ballot language for that truck right. okay. in a future meeting. Yeah. I did put in debt for that truck. So the way long-term financing works is the best bet is to get your debt through the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank. They do this pooled offering of every town mm -hmm. that goes in. Um, piggyback off the state's credit rating, so it's a really cheap way to get long-term cash. Um, so I assume the truck would be voter approved. Um, when you go through the bond bank, you've actually got two years where you can pay interest only if you want, um, which is more costly long-term, obviously. Right. Uh, but I, you make payments um, twice a year, one's principal, one, one's, one's principal and interest, one is interest only. Um, I did put some funds in here um, assuming that you know that the overall budget and tax rate were okay, and so we wouldn't need to delay any payments of that. We could essentially pay half the cost in the first year, and the full cost would be next year in 2025. Mm -hmm. So we we formally borrow the money in the summer of 2024, and when you do something short term in the meantime, depending on when the cash is due, and then we'd have the long term bond mm -hmm. pay it for something like 20 years. And you know, speaking of apparatus, I mean, the truck that, assuming everything's a, a go, uh, was the truck that was to be replaced in 2021. Mm -hmm. and there was some good. We discussed it and why we set it back a little bit. Yep. Um, but in 2022, we were supposed to get the second tank truck. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if that goes too far in, you're then putting it at about the same time talking about a mini pump. <coughs> Uh, so I, I can work with Tom, and I've kind of got a plan on how we can split that up a little bit and make it a little more consistent as opposed to, you know, two big trucks. Yeah, that's year. I think what we want to avoid, is uh, hitting, hitting two big hits uh, right. on a continual basis because they're all going to time out at the same time, right? Well, you know, we've, we've tried to split them up a little bit. The, the problem was when you buy a fire truck in the town and a fire truck in the village, you buy them from the same vendor at the same time, and then you merge, you got two trucks that are the same time. Right. And in this case, we had two engines and two tank trucks. Uh, so the next tank truck, you know, I, I think we ought to be looking at 2025, start having that discussion, maybe get into the same agreement with the same vendor, I think. He's got another demo truck that he's already gotten in line. That will save us a lot of money, and this is just talking points. Um, and combine that with a replacement <coughs> of the pickup truck, which is due in 2026. So you get rid of that a year earlier, switch that. But then you only have one truck, the mini pumper, in 2026. Uh, unless you want to do them all. Which <coughs> I don't think you want to do. But, if, but I can work with Tom. We can come up with a creative way to, to Balance. Being a useful exercise, yes. Yeah, I think that having a balance as opposed to a couple bigger trucks at one time. Yeah. Yeah. But with the number of trucks that you have, it's hard not to have some years we need to. Right. Because, just, I mean, we revamped the schedule several times. Yeah. But in the old days, when there were two municipalities, it was, it was cheaper to buy two trucks at the same time. So right. they all you know, wanted to do that. But now we need to now we put it find a different way. You know, when uh, certain trucks last 20 years and other trucks last five years or eight years, whatever, at some point they overlap. And uh, we try to adjust it. But the, the, the ones that Waterbury has been really good about, um, which would cause me the greatest concern if there was a problem, <coughs> are the are the engines, the pump trucks. Um, NFPA says 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the outcome of getting close to that 20 years when we had a blown engine and, and we had a leaking tank and we were able to, to get a demo truck that was on its way, mm -hmm. um, or was actually here. Uh, so there, yeah, the other trucks, the tank trucks, not as important, but then you start working into maintenance issues. Um, so. You know, we're a little bit past those, not the end of the world, mm -hmm. um, but it's something that you know we ought to take a look at and I'll work with Tom and how we can do that and do it in a, the most cost-effective way, not just order a truck. Um, <coughs> you know, 
we can get one that's a standardized truck that's in the, in the, the queue already, as opposed to spending another 75000 on top of that to do our own, just doesn't make sense to me financially. Right. And again, I hope to be in a situation in a year or two where we can say, hey, you know, we have this local option tax, we made a new fund, you know, we, we took in 700000 last year and spent four fifty. We have this capital expense, maybe we allocate some cash towards it. Mm -hmm. um, I like the way that uh, the local option tax revenue keeps growing a little bit. Yeah. 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 And how it's spent also has new uh, yeah, it, tentacles. It, it, the cheapest we have two million for a truck that to do is, is a pickup truck. Um, you know, that, that is like pennies on the dollar compared to you know, a half a million dollar truck. Uh, we certainly won't get the size truck we have now. It was the only one that was available. We wanted a, uh, an F2 or that series, of, whether it was a Chevy or a, mm -hmm. a Ford. Yeah. Uh, a, yeah, we wanted an F250 short bed because it was just too much, especially with the, the old water department building that we were putting it in. Um, and the only thing that we could get was a 350 long bed. Hmm. And it's, it, it takes an airport to turn that thing around. It's, it's absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. um, but it's near the end of its life, and if we balance it off, then we get rid of that uh, a year before it's scheduled. But it financially, I think so. That's an F2. We just bought an F250 for E5. I, I believe that was 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, just under. Just under. Just under. Yeah. Two seater, eight foot bed. Ours would, uh, ours would be. Uh, a four door. <coughs> but about this, a little more, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, but a, a not, short not a Right. Well, but the availability of trucks is, is starting to grow again, so that's uh, should give you some options. In yeah. terms of the budget, so we have to have that separate warning item that will be on, which is for the full 435 or whatever that we previously full, approved. Uh, yeah. And what we're seeing reflected is approximately <coughs> 200 of that in line. In the debt principal line, is that um, the debt the debt principal contains a, contains an estimated payment um, contains our estimated half the estimated cost for the year. Um, so assuming we bond over twenty years, and as of right now, long -term, it's only for the twenty year bond, okay, and the rest is for other existing debt. Thank you. Yeah, and I can I can give you the whole debt schedule. Oh yeah, no, it's fine. Have, that was um, just what I wanted to clarify. And as of today, um, the bond bank is actually going out, they think, in early March, and the EFOOT will be an issue, but uh, they're still thinking 3 4% mm -hmm. on 20-year cash. So interest That's rates have, have gone up. You know, the days of, the days of you know, towns borrowing 30-year cash at 2 and a half are, are done, but they haven't gone up as much as homeowner rates are, so they're still in a pretty good position. Uh, any other questions for Gary? So the only other thing that um, I would put out, and I'll, it's just a brief discussion, is when we built the stations, we have found that the, um, the heating system, the, the, the furnace, if you will, was not designed for this size station <coughs> down here. The one in Maple Street, it's the right size. But what we've encountered each year is more and more heating problems and the alarm going off. Uh, so that, not this coming year, but probably next year is gonna be on uh, the bubble to replace that system with a system that's actually designed to heat that building. Uh, we right can now, tell you what not to get. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we can get some counseling over here. <laughs> See, I love this temperature. Mm. I'm good with this, mm. but mm. I get that other people aren't. Uh, my wife would not be happy right now. But you know, that, that's just coming down the road. We are looking at doing some work this year um, to the to the building. Um, and it's it's been they've been both have been great buildings, but we are doing some periodic stuff. We've replaced a couple doors. We're going to replace another one this coming year. Um, overhead. You know, yeah. bay doors. Uh, we're going to replace two walkthrough doors uh, at the Main Street station. At the front of the station, you see a walkthrough door on the left hand side. 
and then there's one that goes right into the apparatus bay, and they're rusting. Um, and we don't really know how we could have done anything any different. There's salt, and that's just the way it is, on the outside of the outside door, and inside where the trucks get washed off, uh, there's water. There's water. Um, I have already met with DEW. They built the station. Um, it's actually the son of the guy that was the superintendent of the project. So um, he's going to try and help us a little bit with that, but the plan is to replace those with fiberglass doors and the casings as opposed to steel. Yeah. And then that will get us way past when I won't care anymore. I'll still care, but it just won't be my problem. Okay. And that'll be for 2020. So the, the doors are this coming year. That's on there. Okay. But the furnace system, furnace the heating system will be yeah, sure. 2025. But yeah. you know, it's just on the bubble. Yep. Yeah. Chris. Two quick questions. Gary, do you uh, I don't recall uh, that the village fire station, is that all radiant heat? Uh, it is downstairs, not upstairs. It's upstairs is radiator. Radiator so and it's the, just a matter of upsizing the boiler then. It's not, correct. It's not yep. replacing the Right. Uh, and I, yeah. uh, I just had a quick question for Tom. That answers my question, Gary. Thanks. Um, when you talked about the Duxbury uh, Waterbury contract, you're saying that our grand house is outpacing the area we covered for them. Are you suggesting that, if I remember correctly, and you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they will actually, based on the formula, the current formula, they would end up benefiting more as we, as our grand house. Yeah, and it, it's it's not a lot in one year. It's a few hundred bucks, but you know, you give it you give it some time and it'll grow. So I think at some point. <laughs> um, and you're basically looking to hold a better figure from them as we, I won't say continue to lose, but we continue to outpace them. And yeah, it and would, I. It would tip, tip them in more yeah, favor. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's small amounts, yeah. but, but yeah. you know, you might look at it in 10 years and, and think it's not so small. So right. it's not an urgent thing, and I don't want to cause a big issue with Duxbury. Yeah. Um, I think it's a minor issue. So I don't want to change it this year, but I just want to alert them of the issue. And, and you know, it's it's literally you know a few hundred dollars here and there, and you know that could change, and their grand list could explode at some point. Um, well, the, topo but the, the, the topography for that area that we covered for them is pretty difficult. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't. See yeah. I don't, I don't either. So I think at some point, just sort of pegging it. To something different, like inflation, might make a little more sense. But, but the challenge was we the <coughs> argument we made when we got that contract because we went from going, you know, getting like twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars a year to getting a hundred, and now it's up to one hundred and fifteen or whatever it is. And the argument that we used was, you know, it's one department covering this area, so we should use the grand list of the whole area. So you know, that's that's. It's as if it's one grand list is what how the formula works. So yeah. if they're if we're going a little faster than they are, uh, and I'm not here to defend Duxbury, but the argument that was made to them was, you know, you should um, you should pay as if we had one grand list covering this mm -hmm. whole service area, and their pushback was, well, but we don't get to vote on, it. you know, we don't get to vote to to buy a truck, we don't get to vote to set the budget. You do all that, and we have to pay for it. So, I mean, there's no nothing wrong with looking at it and thinking about it, but I think, you know, Tom's statement that you don't want to do anything to, you know, upset the apple cart and, you know, try to get $2,000 more and end up losing the whole thing. You don't want to do that. Okay, we're good. All right. So, yeah, just somebody let me know some evening, early evening, late yeah. evening. I don't care. I'm up until usually 11 o'clock anyway. Uh, be happy to have you. And we could do two stations in one door. I mean, it wouldn't take that long. Uh -huh. um, or we could do them two separate nights. Okay. okay.
and uh, talked at the end of the evening about uh, plans to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm so sorry. I need a snack. If anyone wants a snack. Those fruit gushers? Yeah. 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 See, only so the line again. But the snacks show back up. You only talked about a snack budget. Um, I'm not seeing I'm in. Fisher left. I was saying, I contributed to the snack. So I feel. The FEMA <laughs> snack budget. Someone called the White House. Sorry, how's it going? Where is. Mm -hmm. About halfway through. Okay. All right, well. Uh, I'm there for well funded. There's public works, libraries, and planning and zoning on the back of the library. Back of the library. Inspire. 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 All right. We're going to move on to planning and zoning. Separate. If there was, it doesn't matter for this year, but. Fire and Fire and Years have separate capital funds for buildings and uh, vehicles, okay. and that's just one. Right, it is, yeah, it's still, so Highway has its own. Highway has its yeah. own. <laughs> highway had three in prior years, well, and there's right. one. Fire had two, there's one. There's still a separate one for parks and rent. Okay. I feel like that was pretty, pretty reasonable. Okay, it was front whenever we're planning and zoning. I had to page through it three times to find it myself. Mm -hmm. Planning and zoning is like in here. I, don't know. Uh, I just kind of um, I didn't find it. I <laughs> so planning and zoning, there's actually an awful lot of action um, in the department. <coughs> we have a proposal before you, um, and it doesn't, doesn't need to Wait, it's something that the select board can approve at their discretion. <laughs> and that's the. Thank you. That's the fee proposal. <laughs> <coughs> and there was a memo that went with that and then included some, some comparables to other towns. Yeah, the memo's there too. Okay. But the long and short of it is we are. Um, I was unable to find um, when our when our fees were or less modified. Um, it's, it's, so it, it's likely some time ago, but in looking at comparables, this is not an attempt to generate revenue. It's an attempt to charge fees consistent with other towns. Mm -hmm. um, some towns have a model that that I hate, where the fees are based on construction costs. I just don't see how you ground truth that. Someone comes in and says they're going to build a house for 250 grand and it's a 2,500 square foot house. How do you, you know, you have to question that and then you get into these awkward conversations. So I think having a fee on per square foot basis is the, the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, after sending it, we um, realized we made an error at the bottom, the, the second one from the bottom. Um, we jumped the gun and we put in the rental registry as a mistake, thinking that. Um, we didn't fees for that? No, we, we didn't propose a fee, but there's no ordinance yet. Okay. So I'd recommend just scratching that for a later discussion. <laughs> um, and to clarify on the legal reviews, um, it's up to $300 an hour. So. There are more complex cases that require legal reviews, but, but essentially what we're saying is the first hour is, is a fee, and beyond that, it's a town cost. Um, which, again, I think is reasonable, because sometimes the legal review is it's, it's, it's project specific, and it's, um, it's not always obvious what will require some legal work and what will not. Sometimes it really depends on some some vagaries of the zoning of the zoning laws. You um, said you would inform an applicant, right? Yeah. This is your charge. Um, and I think the rest is is fairly consistent with with some other towns of our size. Um, <coughs> in in thinking about this a little more over the weekend, um, something to to consider perhaps. <coughs> 
is, you know, the based on the bylaws and the updates, which are not adopted yet, of course, um, but that's going to be on the desk soon enough. <laughs> um, you know, the the bylaws encourage density, particularly um, in areas where there's water and sewer, <laughs> and so. You might want to consider, um, after thinking about this further, um, some sort of a reduction in the per square foot fee if perhaps you're on the water or so. Be a little consistent with, with what we're trying to do through the bylaws, at least what the PC desires to do. So, you know, if you wanted to consider something like five cents per square foot reduction for water and five for sewer, um, something like that would be pretty reasonable, I think. But I think in general the fees are consistent with what other towns charge for. Um, <coughs> and obviously has a revenue impact on the budget. I think the fifty thousand dollars is is pretty reasonably conservative just based on um, what's been permitted in, in prior years. That after the fact fee <coughs> went way up. Which one, sorry? Yep. <laughs> the after the fact zone anything? Yeah, I think that's important to have that. Yeah. <laughs> to have that be a substantial one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that really shouldn't occur. It should be a should be as rare as hen's teeth to, to charge that. But I think it's important for it to be there. I think since I've been here we've run into one case where someone someone did something substantial with that apartment. But I also think it's pretty routine that if you're if you're building in a town in Vermont, you need to call the town office and figure out if you need a permit or not. Um. Look, Tom, mm -hmm. can you tell me about it's highlighted. It says new, no charge, abandoned, blighted, unoccupied <coughs> permit. Yeah, um, and so that's that's in essence so we're aware of it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and in some cases, that's just an issue of who to call. So there's really there's really no work on our part, but we want to we want to be aware of those issues, and so often those are the properties that generate complaints. We don't have a lot of them in Waterbury. Um, it's really just about our knowledge. Right. <coughs> Tom, yes, sir. Um, when you have under zoning compliance verification letters, you can come about certificate of occupancy letters. Yes. Boy, that's pretty onerous because sometimes. <coughs> Banks in mortgages for a small mortgage, they're looking, that's a pretty big number. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of a new house, it's not such a big number, but if you have a little, you know, you know, addition being put on or mm -hmm. some sort of modification, that's kind of onerous. That's, that's up to you to reduce if yeah. that's your desire. Zone compliance verification. My my big my big push on these fees is I think the forty dollars per square foot is, is reasonable and consistent with the other towns. If 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 you want to say that legal reviews are, are the town's problem or if or if zoning compliance verification letters should be a lower amount or zero, I have I have no pride of authorship. Yeah. Really beyond uh, the, the few major items. I'm looking at more of like there would be some sort of differentiation between yeah, a money. minor project and a major project. Just you know, where you know, a minor project, you know, because it's always expense to do any of this mm -hmm. stuff. Sure. And I don't you know, if, if we were charging someone for <coughs> doing a, a little project in their house to charge them fifty bucks, I don't have as much of a problem. But to charge someone who's doing a small project three hundred dollars, mm -hmm. especially someone who's low to moderate income. I think that's more of a problem. Does I know what you're talking about. Well, I'm just asking because we don't do these now. Does, does this zoning compliance letter going to require staff to go out to the property to ensure compliance? Because previously we didn't do that. Right. So this would be. So if we're going to require it, I don't think three hundred dollars is too much to ask. You're going to pay more than that in interest on your first. <coughs> I think it was indicative steps, right? I know a previous CI wanted us to stop pushing them all together. We did. Were, well, yeah, we did. So, and I would note that we also don't do certificates of occupancy but, right now. Oh, so it could be required of them. Even oh, it's going to be. You know, now in the mortgage industry, 
that's going to be a total, you know, whether you do a little $3,000 project or if you do a $500,000 project, you, you, you're going to have to do that. And that's what someone who's doing a little tiny project, I kind of, I don't know. I know it's, we want to cover our costs in doing kind of things, but I think it's a little more cursory on a small project than it is a big project. Would a percentage make sense, or is that too complicated? I think that gets complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, this also, you know, as Karen pointed out, if we're sending someone out to check for compliance, we, you know, we now have, um, you know, sort of an enforcement apparatus. We're paying someone to do that without raising taxes. You know, so. Well, I'll just draw my line in the sand that I spent an hour with Tom this morning talking through these. So I'm, I have a lot of like small $50 tweaks and I kind of took the approach of like, like we don't really need to add $50 to the ADU permit. And if you have a new ADU, I think it should be the same as one within the footprint, but we can talk through staff time. I personally like the water sewer proposal. Personally, I kind of landed on like, I think these are good and necessary updates. I, so I guess I would say like, if we're gonna have a conversation about tweaking some of them, I have like five more things I would want to discuss. I'm also comfortable adopting this as a good appropriate update right now. Um, but <coughs> I was trying to, I, don't know, I guess I just want to be honest of like, yeah, there's things I would get into a lot more detail now, but if the board is comfortable with, I'm comfortable with it as a whole. What would be the next time to discuss? Like if it was adopted now, when would a revisit happen? I guess my concern is the things that yeah. we wrote 50 years ago that we're still using right. no one. So like, is it worth that extra time? Or saying we adopt it now, but putting on a calendar, a, a revisit? Um, the reality is most of these fees wouldn't come into play very often. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, a revisit in a few months would be pretty easy. Okay. Is there a reason to adopt them now and not as opposed to a few months from now? Where there's always a revenue reason. Um, <coughs> and a, a big part of it is I think, you know, we've got, got an office, we've got a new team there, we've got other costs in the budget um, that are related to what we're trying to accomplish in terms of um, getting a software package for people to do their permitting online. We could have a rental registry online as part of that if desired. And then also we're trying to work hard to get to the point where we're doing real enforcement, which is something the, the DRB tells us a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's some legal costs in there to help us prep for that. And so I think this is part of that, part of that strategy is on the one hand, we needed to update the fees because they were just not consistent with our peers. On the other hand, we do have some increased costs in the budget related to the desire to do zoning enforcement. Um, so I think they're, to some extent, bound. And you know, I, I have a general, I have a general approach to things, and I can correct this if it's wrong. But my general approach is. Um, you know the way you the way you hold the line as best you can on taxes is you you try to you you try to do it through reasonable user fees and that applies to this and that applies to recreation and other things and I think I think our fees right now are below market. Mm -hmm. Maybe the market's not reasonable, but we're below market. <coughs> I would agree with that statement, Tom, that we are below market, <coughs> but I do think there are differences in projects, and that's that's where. I have a little angst on, uh, on, on this, you know, are we going to really affect, you know, I've worked a lot with low to moderate income people and this is going to have a adverse effect, you know, I, I'm all for, you know, we, I don't want to raise people's taxes, but also I hate to, you know, have someone where you're going to have costs that are going to prevent someone from doing a project. You know, sure. the cost of the, you know, especially on a little two, three thousand dollar project. Sure. So, Mike, do you have an alternative uh, proposal, or would you <coughs> like to take some time to propose it? 
and this has already suggested she might have 500 tweaks to do as well. And, uh, for the purposes of tonight, I will move to adopt the updated fee schedule as proposed. Mike does 150 for zoning compliance letters. Feel more reasonable? Yeah. Because I do, I hear your argument that that's a mortgage that's less elective. I would note that the very modest things. Every this, mortgage now is going to ask. Yeah, that. but but like establishing a home occupation and existing uses no, and porches <laughs> are like 50 bucks. So I personally feel very comfortable with residents right. who want to do a modest project in their home. That's a pretty reasonable fee. Um, noting that the legal review would be $300, up to $300, but not the whole bill. Um, and then note we can revisit in the future, but I'll move to adopt as proposed with zoning compliance verification 150 and noting that we don't have a rental registry, so that shouldn't be included. Yeah. Second. Second. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I, I need you to clarify. Are you changing something in the language about the $300 legal fee? It said $300 yeah, it's, per hour. It's it would $300 be up. up to $300. Yeah. Per hour up to three hundred dollars, or would be. I don't like that. So that's it. Just change to up to three hundred dollars. Yeah, and then zoning compliance. That's it. I got those two. Just Thank like you. Three hundred. Thank you. Okay, it's, it, it's just the problem is like, I just last month went to motor vehicles. You look at what more, and, and then going up this year, you know, I saw what some of the expenses, you know, it's like fees. You know, everyone doesn't like taxes, but fees hit you just as much as taxes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, again, I think these are pretty modest. If they it's are. like a subdivision, or I mean, and I want to support the more housing growth too. So I will also say, you know, new accessory dwelling unit that can be up to 1,400 square feet. Now that's going from 200 to 560 under the 40 per square foot total. I still felt like that wasn't a detriment to develop. I'm open to us lowering it in the future, but. Mm -hmm. Now I assume we have zero at rent, residential rental registry, because that's not yet developed. Yeah, that's yeah just we're just straightening that, away. and then we just can amend right. further okay. based on. Okay, moving and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, please. Um, on the rest of the budget, um, a couple things I want to I want to highlight. Um, the professional services there's ten thousand dollars budgeted, which is um, about a threefold increase what we've had in the past. Um, I was really convinced of this. Um, the, the presentation that the SE group did, the open, the, the second open house with the. To me, it really brought home the zoning bylaw changes just to, to see the, the slip graphics they produced. Mm -hmm. um, they've helped a lot to help staff and the planning commission move along in the process. And that works to continue in 2024, but Thank you. What, I, what I would like to see is the bylaws will be, for, will be before you in February. Um, I'd like to see the Planning Commission and the staff take a little bit of a break since they've been meeting weekly for a while now. But then they want to start attacking the rest of the town. And, and you know, I think at some point there should be a conversation between staff and the Select Board Planning Commission about how you go about doing that in the most constructive way. Because if you just say, go forth and conquer all of the town north of 89. Yeah, you no, we'll see. Great, we'll see. Yeah, you we'll almost see want to go like district, district by district. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we want to have a good targeted approach, and there's a lot of people with different ideas about yeah. that. But I think the consultant's going to help us, and I think that mm -hmm. should probably be a line item for a long time, as long as we're doing this. Um, and something I've said to a number of people is, you know, bylaws don't have to be this 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 issue take years to update. You can, you know, if there are certain things in the current round of bylaw updates that apply to the rest of the town, you can do that. You don't need to do a comprehensive update. It's of course great if you can do that, but it might be nice to just make some progress along the way. And a lot of towns have bylaw updates on a routine basis in front of the select board. And that would be, I think, the goal to get reasonably current and then just keep chipping away. Mm -hmm. But I think we can have a conversation about that 
once we're through the, the big project in front of us now. Um, the other piece is there's a, um, so there's some reductions, bylaw rewrite um, that was substantially grant funded and the rec master plan and those projects are, are essentially done. Um, there's a big increase in legal services, um, even though we had a little actual in 2023, maybe a few lingering bills, but that won't go up dramatically. And the, the logic behind that is we've reached out to an attorney um, and had the conversation to essentially acknowledge that we haven't done significant zoning enforcement in some time. And so we want to have a good playbook get the legal advice in advance and, and have some counsel to tackle some of the immediate challenges before us so that we avoid those challenges. So we're, our thinking is the legal budget goes up for one year and then we've got the playbook. Um, and there's always going to be, be a need for some legal advice in that office. Um, of course, the more enforcement you do, the more likely you are to have challenges. Um, but the direction the DRB seems to be giving us is there's some enforcement that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it's way overdue. So I think, you know, the enforcement's going to start, but it won't happen on day one. Right. It's going to take a little bit of time to, to get there. Um, and we'll just be careful about it. <coughs> and then going further down, there's a, there's a big line item for a software suite, and that's for the uh, proposed permitting software. Um, what's nice about the software is <coughs> You know, no town has a perfect pipeline from the permitting office to the lister. But with software, it gets a little stronger because the lister can have access to it too. So the lister can know what's coming in advance, what's happened, and make sure that he's going to go out there and make sure he values those properties and doesn't miss growth. So that's, that's important. That adds some grandless growth, probably on the margins, but I think it matters over time. And a big part of this is it would all be moved online. Um, so part of the cost is just, it's higher in the first year because there's some transition um, and there's some taking of the recent data and getting it into the system. Um, so there will be an annual fee, but not at that level? Not that level, but it's not going to go dramatically down. It's going to go to 15. Okay. Um, but that's the cost of just having an online information mm -hmm. system. But I think it's, it's time. Mm -hmm. And I think from the, from the user perspective, it's <coughs> it's better. And then the other piece, I, I'm happy with our staff now, but when we were looking for um, the planning zoning director, we had a candidate um, who had some personal issues and couldn't take the job unless it was substantially remote. Mm -hmm. um, this is a walk in off, you know, this is, this is small town Vermont. We got a lot of foot traffic, but with the software, we could maybe at some point have that conversation with the job candidate say, well, it can't be fully remote, but if it's online, then work can be online, and maybe it can be partially remote. Maybe we can make that work between two staff having office coverage. So it gives us some flexibility. Um, and, and even just for the staff we have now, if, if there's some sort of challenge in their, in their work-life balance, we can find a way to make it better, I think. So yeah, it'll, it'll go down and it would go down in 2025, but not dramatically. And that's, um, that's planning and zoning in a, in a nutshell. Um, there's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, can you remind me, I'm having a senior moment, the um, reclassifying of revitalizing Waterbury to <coughs> general government. Why did we do that again? Um, Trying to remember. I think part of it was, I could be wrong, there, I think there was a base appropriation to, to RW and then it was increased to pay for the economic development position. Okay. But it's established, so I think we can just put it in one place okay. and, and go from there. It was because we had a beautification line in the planning budget forever and then revitalizing Waterbury came along and it was, we stuck it there. So yeah. it, it, it doesn't work for Tom there. It's That's fine. Like somewhere I just couldn't remember why. It's it just, it. and there's a lot more in it now than exactly. originally. So and the, the uh, economic development director money comes out of the general fund 
parking goes there. So putting it for that is a good idea. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The, the line that says PZ Central Vermont Economic <coughs> Duh, is that, is that to Central Vermont Regional Planning? No. No, no Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation. Okay, so that's not the invoice that I was supposed to pay. <laughs> yeah, CBEDC. Yeah, CB there is the two. So, no, no. There's two. Central Law Regional Planning Commission and Central Law Economic, Economic Development Corporation. Okay. And that one's like $2,000, and the Planning Commission is $35,000 or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Second. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's that bias? No, there's one in my spreadsheet. There are like special articles or something. Um, I've had a few meetings with Melissa Bounty, who's the executive director, and, and it bought EFA a state grant to, for 600 grand to do the Route 100 water line. Mm -hmm. So she was instrumental in helping me get that across the finish line. So I think, I think on grant funding, they can be a big help, um, and she's. She may be part of a selection committee, or she's sort of an advisor to the. In this case, it was it was it was ACCD um, to advise us some some lobbying power, if nothing else. And I think it's um, you know she's sort of the, the guardian of the regional economic plan. So if you're if you're proposing something within the confines of that, she can help you champion it. And they were very instrumental with the Benji grant for uh, ID Computer and yeah. even the one that ended up not coming. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's cheap. Um, I was just saying, it's really the like state apparatus for going from like a statewide um, agency of commerce and community development out to regions is through these 11 regional development corporations. So that's uh -huh. our corresponding one. So per Tom's point, like grants especially, um, the ambulance actually just got in the list of like 10 regional priority projects for central Vermont. So again, they're facilitating that, but often like when I was economic development director, that person got a call from the state, hey, we need XYZ office space, and they would then call me and say like, do you have anything in Waterbury that meets these needs? Mm -hmm. So it's just one of these, we don't quite have the regionalization, we don't quite have the counties, but if it was to work, it would be along that model of that in-between level. Two thousand bucks is cheap. Best sales ever. Well spent. No, no. <laughs> it's been two thousand dollars. Six fold in grants. Two thousand dollars for thirty years. I mean, it doesn't go up. So. Yeah, this is the one though that I'm thinking about. Okay. okay. Any other questions on zoning and planning? Um, oh, I was just saying, having just made the motion to approve the fee increases, mm -hmm. is 50 realistic or should we do 40 to be conservative? I think I think 50 is conservative. Okay. Um, if we had had these fees in place in 2023, it would have been 60. Great. Okay. Thank you. So. <clears throat> All right. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. For all of that. <coughs> Um, 45 minutes behind. Not the same on the on-time. Start off so promising. Uh, next on the agenda is penalty tax rate. And I'm not sure we need to have a huge conversation about this. Um, so this probably comes up every year. Um, you have you have a few people that miss the day by a few days. You have a few people that consistently miss it every year, and they cry about the penalty. Penalty is is eight percent set by the voters on meeting day, and I, I dare say you'd probably struggle to find a town that doesn't charge the same penalty. There's, there's a few out there, but it's statutory maximum. And what I say to the people who call and complain is that I have no authority to, to waive your penalty. It was voter approved, and if I waive your penalty, I'm essentially committing fraud at that point. So I'm not going to do that. Um, and your options are to um, try to have a conversation with anyone on the select board um, or try to have a conversation at town meeting day. Um, um, and then, you know, after the due date, those calls die down within two or three weeks. And I think once people are a few weeks late, they sort of acknowledge that it's a problem. <laughs> uh, it's their problem, if you will. Um, so I don't, I'm not convinced that anything needs to change per se. Um, 
but I think at one point we just decided to put it on the agenda and get the, get the opinion of the board if they wanted to do anything different. I would argue you need a penalty because most of what we're collecting is school taxes and we've got to pay that bill no matter what. So the interest and penalties are a big part of making us whole. Um, you know, I, I think one of the conversations that, that is maybe reasonable to consider is some towns will allow a postmark. And since the mail has gotten kludgy of late, that's something that could be considered. It's a little more work for staff to track that. Um, it's not impossible. Um, and we do get those people that say, we do have a few that, I think one or two this year, that did legitimately mail it before the due date at the same time. If you know the mail takes time, mailing it a day before the due date, even if you live in Waterbury, you might not get it done. Um, and I think, and you, can put it in the box. and you can put it in the box. And I think every year there is one or two people who complain that it did legitimately take, for whatever reason, they're not far, but it, it took 10 days to get here. And my answer to that is, you know, I, I get it. In, in my town, you pay one bill a year, and I, I pay that three or four weeks in advance to make sure I see the check clear, because if it doesn't, I'm going to go down and, and avoid the penalty because it's so huge. Um, so I'm not sure you need to do anything. I think if um, if you wanted to consider the the postmark as an option, it's not an undue burden on staff. <coughs> um, but I think if you if you want to consider reducing the penalty, um, at some point I'm going to argue with you. How? Let's How absolutely <laughs> insanely complicated would it be to have a tiered penalty? So one, you know, five business days is four percent, and half that is eight percent. Um, I think pretty difficult. Well, yeah, I had a short conversation with Karen on this, and it seemed like it would be a small nightmare uh, for her to adjudicate all of that, and. This deadline's been around forever. Been um, around forever, yeah. So I, don't I guess I think about you know when we had we had the woman who came, who admits she forgot until 4 p.m. and raced down here and was just too late. She was I here at 4:30 or whatever it was, you know, an hour late. And eight percent is mm -hmm. wild. And she had no qualms about saying like I forgot until the <coughs> moment, and then I just got there too late. And on one hand, absolutely. She missed it. There's this fee. On the other hand, that is a wild fee for, in her experience, is a half hour. And I don't know if there's a solution to that, but I like thinking about it, talking about it, considering that some people can't send their bill in 30 days early to watch the check clear because it isn't in there. Yeah. They need to wait until it's due. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's the person, you know, personal responsibility conversation, but I just, I just feel like it's worth talking about and thinking if there are solutions, and if there aren't, there aren't. But rather than just saying people need to figure them figure it out, I don't always think is like the way to go. Mm -hmm. I'm not running the meeting, but <laughs> well, no, 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 I'm just gonna, no, no, I just no, no. You're very <clears throat> empathetic to people who have financial <clears throat> issues. So in that exercise, I feel like I need to point out that the little old lady who's on the fixed income, who still isn't going to pay within 30 days, she's the one that's going to pay that eight percent opposed to yeah. the woman. That but that is care. a grave, you know, 30 days is wildly different than But she's minutes. the one who's financial str financially right. struggling. And, you know, heard, and I can't solve everybody. <laughs> right, but I can't solve everybody's problem, right? Like what she needs is social services and, and assistant to help her run her calendar. We can't do that. Yeah. But we can think about what might have happen often enough that it needs a solution. Or if it's one person once a year, it doesn't need a solution. You know, but if it's a dozen plus people who are late by one day, 48 <coughs> hours, maybe there is something we can do for that, like subset of people. But there is already something you can do for it. You, you I allow, didn't hear you, you, that up. Direct I, I said you already have a system in place where people can sign up for ACH. Right. They don't have to deliver their check. They don't have to drop it in the mailbox. You send out a notice and say, if you want to sign up by ACH, just make sure your money's in the bank on the day it's due and you'll take it out. And 
And you know, I dealt with this issue for 40 years, and, and we used to accept postmarks. And when we were in the fire station, I remember one specific day, there was a person yelling at the tax clerk, it wasn't Karen at the time, it was uh, the person before Karen, and the, the guy was very upset. And we told him, sorry, we don't have the authority to change it, blah, blah, blah. And while we were talking, the mailman came in and dumped 15 tax bills that had a postmark on it and said, are they going to get a tax penalty? No, because it's postmark. Well, then I'm paying a penalty, but they put it in the mail, and it's getting here at the same time. And so we did away with the postmark thing. I think there are many envelopes that come through the mail now that don't have postmarks. That's so correct. you're not going to be able to tell. Any bank check. Postmark. Any bank check doesn't have a postmark. So, you know, I, I would just say you're never going to solve the problem every year when taxes are due, no matter when the <coughs> deadline is, no matter whether you tell the person that well, you were half an hour late, so you're you're a day you're a day late. You come in on Monday instead of Friday, and and those people get four percent. Well, the people who come in Tuesday are going to say, well, I only missed it by a day. There's always going to be a, a deadline that has been missed. So I think you just kind of, if you're this staff person, you suck it up, and you not understand that people are going to yell at you for a little bit and then it calms down and it goes away. And this is a perennial, a perennial thing. We had this conversation on the town meeting floor probably eight or nine years ago when the guy who was yelling about the postmark brought it up and we had a big conversation and the town voted the taxes are due at 4.30 and it's 8% and it's 1% interest. So. So you can talk about it every time, but it's going to be this. It's going to be the same. I agree with that. I, be the same. I agree with Bill, with the exception of I think the postmark is a reasonable alternative because if someone does have a post, you, you can actually say, "I want you to stamp stamp my my thing," so I I know because we're seeing mail taking five, 10 days sometimes to get to places, but it's no excuse, and I'm one. I came, I was coming from Northern Vermont, and I usually pay my taxes on the last day because I don't like losing any interest, and I was stuck in traffic, and I kicked, was a half hour late, and I sucked it up. And you, you know I'll never miss that tax payment again, and as Bill said, you have that ACH, you know, option. You know, just use it. You know, it, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's just people don't want to do it. Chris, I'll make it quick. You just hit it on the head. You got stung once, right? And you learned, all right? Yeah. This this enabling people to continue to forget, to continue to miss, to continue to come up with an excuse. It's unadult. And it's not fair. If my wife was here, she would be unloading on the select board as to the reasons why not to change the current system. Because she spent 35 years dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's had so much experience with it that the current system that's in place is the only thing that seems to work and work fairly. You know, there's, there's, it's called tough love. Sometimes you just got to get spanked. You know, and, and my wife would tell me about these older people that would come in, tears running down their face, paying their bills with their hands shaking because they didn't have the money, but they were there to pay the bill on time because they knew they had to. And she felt real bad for those people. Because they really didn't have money. Mm -hmm. What I will say is, and this is on the this page here. So in 2023, between tax interests and penalties, we collected 110,000. 2024 is proposed about the same. Just a few years ago, 
that was less than 70, if in fact there's going to be a school increase of 18% or something. On the one hand, we've got to pay the school, that's a guarantee. On the other hand, we can reasonably expect more delinquencies, more penalties and interest as a result of the bills going up. Um, I don't know if that changes anyone's thoughts one way or another. I think it's probably something we'll see. Did we try, wasn't it lower during COVID? Wasn't it 2% during COVID or did, it, did the board do that? We had some, some abatement in, in terms of I just thought penalty not paying was lower because we were concerned about right. During COVID, but that's a No, no, I know. I'm just like, I'm wondering if that's why the 2020 was low. Oh. Um, and then 2021. Yeah, just for Tom's point, because that actually does alarm me, but I do recall there was a year. While I understand that people have impassioned opinions and that we need a revenue source, I would also be curious to look at, as Alyssa pointed out, maybe outside of pandemic years, if there are years where it was significantly different or slightly lower, slightly higher, how the revenue changed. Um, if our goal is a high fee to prevent people from paying late, then the ideal outcome is nobody pays late and we have no revenue. If we have a lower fee, um, maybe, pe maybe it's not as much of a deterrent, but then more people do it and then we have a higher revenue. So I kind of hear us talking about wanting two things. We want to deter people from paying late, but we also want the revenue, and those two things oppose each other. I don't have a solution. I'm not pro proposing something. I would be curious to look at if there is actual data to be mined that says when we have a lower fee, more people pay late, and we get a higher revenue. Yeah, we can go back 10, 15. So I'd be curious to see that, because maybe then we take it from 8% to 6%. The revenue doesn't really change. It's just more money from more people instead of more money from fewer people. I want a hundred percent compliance. There was a minute. Look at you going. Yeah. Was it? Uh, when you look at staff time chasing all, all people, I think it's kind of it costs money. Which I mean, four percent and no interest until April. Yeah. So then you're going to pursue that one, Tom? Yeah, I'll follow up. Thank you. Okay. We only had one due date in 2020 because we didn't get a tax rate. I was on the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Will this question ultimately be brought to the town voters, or will you? If, uh, I think you, not until we come up with what we think is a workable alternative. Uh, as of now, it's the same policy that we've got. Well, the change. The motion to collect taxes has the penalty and the due date and everything in it. So mm -hmm. that, that's something that comes up every year. Mm -hmm. It has to be on the warning. You know, it's it's on the warning all the time. <coughs> like Chris made a point of it last year. I was sitting next to you at town meeting. You were very clear about that with the voters before they voted on some motion, <laughs> right? You said, you said, I want to be the one to make when we assign who does what. You said, I want to oh, yeah, do this one right. so that I can talk about it. And Karen did just stop. What was that? So in 2020, 2020, we did reduce the penalty from 8% to 4%. Right. Um, and we also extended the interest to the beginning of April. And it was because we only had one tax bill that year, remember, Bill? We didn't get a tax rate until, I don't know, deep into the summer. <coughs> Not in time to mail the tax bills for 30 days, and so we. And, and there was money. special legislation granted that year to allow the select boards to change because we had town meeting before the right. pandemic mm -hmm. happened. So, uh, in a normal year, you don't have the ability to to change what the voters have uh, stated <coughs> at at town meeting. So. so that might answer why it was so much less in 2020. And Danny, I, I mean, I, for what it's worth, really I appreciate your compassion about this. It's just that as a clerk for eight years, this is the kind of topic that comes up. Everybody's really ticked. It lasts two or three weeks. And then people, because they're really mad at themselves. They're not mad at us. Yeah. They're not mad about the 8%. And my, my point is that we either, it's going to continue to come up because select boards change and people have different opinions, ideas, experience. 
So it's either like we allow the conversation or we just say this never gets discussed again, right? So I understand that when you're consistent in a position, you're experiencing it multiple times. But the people at this table, it's important to remember, are not experiencing it for the 12th time, 15th time. It could be the first time or the second time. So it's a new conversation for this group. It's a new conversation the first time someone's late, right? So it's frustrating when you experience something over and over <coughs> again, but to remember that the other person in that conversation is new for them. So everyone's opinion, including people who've experienced this a million times, is really important. Right. Like your input is going to help dictate the decision. And we have to accept that the conversation is going to continue to happen. Um, and I feel like I'll follow up with you, Tom, but I think we're ready to move yeah. forward. I guess the one thing I will add is we had people come in that were still behind on 2022 taxes. And we applied their bill to 20, we applied their payment to 2023, so they avoided the penalty. Right. Yeah. And it's we've just done a that consistently. Mm -hmm. So Danny, I just want to say one last thing from an empathy standpoint. He, he, Bill said one time, you know, we rely on those late penalties and interest for revenue. I said, that's unfortunate that we have to rely on people's misfortunes or mistakes to operate our municipality. So I am empathetic about the extra additional cost, but, you know, it's, it's a tough thing. I think play, we need to move forward to yeah, be, I'm not the chair, but yeah. I just, I think it's time to yeah. move on with the agenda, if that's okay. With I'll Roger. Let, I'll let you guys go. And thanks for everything. <laughs> Sorry, Roger. You're great people. I'll see you later. See you first. <laughs> All right. Unless there's any more discussion on the penalty tax rate, we'll move on. No. Agenda <laughs> <laughs> for the next meeting. Do you want to? Karen was kind enough to draft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is so much for you. Do we want to move? An animal control discussion in this meeting. Yeah, I've got an animal control yeah, ordinance. So <laughs> Assuming <that>. we meet. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, just to be clear, this one's already posted. The oh, okay. Already Thank out. you. Never mind. That's I mean, we could have mentioned that. That's not meeting after next. Yeah. But are you saying you want to delay the deliberative session tonight? Or? Yeah. Oh, was that about? We don't need. I, well, do we need? Do we need one? Yeah, that was. I was unclear. That's why I was confused by the vote. I was unclear if that deliberative session was. Oh, that's tonight's right. dog bite hearing. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, I thought I explained it, but. Uh, oh, no, you were fine, Roger. Yeah, that wasn't on no, you. Know, I just, I should have, just, during discussion, said I wanted to go to deliberative. No, I had, I had brain freeze. I had forgotten about that. Yeah. No, uh, my point was right. that uh, if we couldn't come up with a uh, solution that would be satisfactory <coughs> by 7 o'clock, then we would need a deliberative session. Uh, if we had a motion on the floor, um, and it felt as though it was going to sort of meet uh, the general crux of what was being discussed. We got passed, and so I felt like we didn't really need to, to move that to a later session. So that will save us uh, 15 minutes. And it was already been spent. Um, if you uh, would you like to add. Um, the animal control <coughs> issue to the 22nd? I would. I feel like there's more conversation to be had on that front. And we can hopefully have some ordinance mm -hmm. yeah. fee updates proposed. Mm -hmm. I think, oh, that's just a few of the We probably can't by the year, can we? What? No. We're meeting tomorrow morning. Right, plus, yeah, right. I mean, right, so it's the 22nd, and I guess yeah, I'm struggling a little bit with, right, would be the one that's eligible. <coughs> we skipped a week in our every week, and I guess I'm just saying, looking at this draft agenda, that is quite a lot of content and two very substantive <coughs> conversations, including housing task force, which is short term rental and that, and ordinance. So I, I don't disagree. I'm just looking at the agenda no, mathing, and it's not yes. mathing. Yeah. Um, yeah, looking to. Couldn't we uh, uh, add uh, the uh, ordinance to the 8th uh, at the meeting? 
Or can it be? Can it be? Or? Yeah, but do we have time? Our, our question. So, like, Karen, Tom, and I are meeting at 2 p.m. tomorrow, right. which literally Tom emailed, I will say to his credit, I think to like December 21st, and was like, Hi, we're supposed to meet about this. I propose the 8th. And Karen was like, No, the 5th. And we were like, Okay. And mm -hmm. whoops. <laughs> um, I, I mean, think for the 22nd with Joe's presentation mm -hmm. or. Um, well, if he just does the presentation, it's fine. I don't know if that is if this agenda I mean, item is also they, intended to like be a rental registry conversation, which needs right. more than that. D okay. Um, <coughs> hold on, hold on, because I was going to say that might be a <coughs> that might have longer comment from the public than we have a lot of time for. It's the 29th too late. Are we meeting? We have to meet on the 22nd. Oh, is that still morning? Yeah. I think on the 22nd, um, I don't think the senior the senior center is not asking for any increase this year. So based on that, um, you know, they can come in and get an update, but maybe not during January when the schedule is packed. Because from the budget perspective, I think it's be okay. Um, Similar story for revitalizing Waterbury. They're asking for a very minor inflationary increase, I believe. So, I'm not sure that's a necessary meeting. So, it could be on, on the 22nd that the budget side of it's shortened up a bit. <coughs> I'm I should say that uh, I'm again not going to be in town on the 22nd. I'm going to be in town on the 25th and we want to move it. Uh, or do you want to? Do you want to add? Are you? Do you feel strongly about wanting to move? Is we're here for those budget items? Um, I definitely. Yeah, I mean, I'd be particularly the uh, library budget. I think is uh, important because uh, there's we're asking the, uh, the trust to uh, contribute to uh, some budget increases and, and reluctant to do so. So I think that's going to be so potentially contentious. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the, uh, the cemetery commissioners agree to contribute to more trust. Uh, um, so I made the library chair aware of that. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I mean, if it's okay with everyone, uh, I'd prefer to meet on Thursday the 25th, but uh, you know, if uh, that's not going to work for you, I get it. And then uh, you know, we'll just do the meeting without the Well, I will not be able to be present. I can meet the 25th. And there's no meeting on the week of the 15th. Mm -hmm. That's still mm -hmm. Days, the 24th, and 24th work for people. Uh, I think with King, uh, it's got to be Monday. It does. I mean, you can have a meeting without me. I just mm -hmm. let me in. I thought I heard, do you know, I thought I heard Mike say that the development review board wasn't having their next meeting in January. Do you know? Even if they do, they can meet back there. No, I no, I don't want to ask them to do that because they the meetings that they've had, they, they've had a lot of public attendance. I don't think it would be. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's kind of awkward. Not if you meeting have a hearing and you have to have their, their people going through that. Well, if you would, because he said there wasn't an right. application. It was only like minutes. I feel like he but said I'm, there was nothing. So that would open up Wednesday, January seventeenth, if you need to have an extra meeting that week. Hmm. So there's that. There's a potential for that. Does that work for you, Kim? I mean, I don't think so. I will have to meet anything. It's not on a Monday. Mm -hmm. I'll have to miss, miss anything that's not on a Monday. Okay. So that doesn't solve the problem. Okay. But don't. No, but you want to be here for Hudson Task Force. And you want to yeah. be here for libraries, so it should. Because you can't read one thing. I, I, I can just miss it, or perhaps I can zoom in. So let's just keep it on the place. Okay. 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 Ok
Is it, would Joe be her pair for the eighth? No, I would say Joe very intentionally at the last meeting okay. on the 18th, which is the regular housing class first meeting, to review what he would present on gotcha. the 22nd. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'll, uh, I'll just uh, try to arrange this one. But I mean, I, per, I actually think Joe could go to February, but that doesn't solve the Roger problem. Mm -hmm. Like, you, no, or, well, it or does. The we, then we can make that Thursday, and King wouldn't miss out on housing, which is a big one. That, right? right. But the, the 29th. Uh, do we think we're going to have substantive conversation or is the warrant stuff straightforward? I'm sorry, can you ask me that again? <laughs> yes, especially because I went, <laughs> um, on the 29th, which I know you said we have to meet because we have to sign the warrant, is that super substantive? Like, do we think, will we be able to have an other agenda item? Oh, yeah, no, there, oh, yeah. I think there's time on that agenda. So I'm wondering things. if, given that, I mean, I know we don't want to push the housing project, but also for a one week, do we bump housing to the 29th? I, I can get a hold of Joe. I feel like I already confirmed that thing for him. Not that yeah, oh, he definitely knows. That's what I said, because yeah. he said he was going to review the 18th and plans on that, but assuming he can make it. I, I may have lost track of the goal here. I know yeah, Thursday's no, I still works. It's too late to text him. <laughs> uh, yeah. why, no, why don't I just plan on zooming in on the 22nd? Uh, Danny and I can determine whether she wants to chair or or I, I prefer not to try to chair from the zone. It's not all that easily done. Um, and then, so we'll just keep it on the 22nd. Uh, and if we, uh, we can decide uh, at the next meeting whether we need to add more to the 29th. I did invite EFUD to the 29th to reschedule. Right, so we already have EFUD, which is, you know, that's the one. Uncon unconfirmed, but I invited. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, well that's a big chunk of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a big job. You never know. Warrants first. Your dog ordinance fee schedule discussion tomorrow, to the best of my knowledge, has not landed anywhere. Correct. At this You're point. correct. Yes, oh, correct. Yep. So do you want dogs on the 29th? No, not with the EFAD, please. And uh, well, okay. Unless Unless we get, do we squeeze it in? Unless we get a lot to, so on this, on this draft one for January 22nd, yep. the last item under budget says review draft agenda. That's supposed to say review draft warning. Okay. So if there's time that week, we can mm -hmm. get the warning. You know, if you're, if you're ready, then we can have a lot of that done that night, freeing up a lot of time on the 29th. Maybe we can wait and see where we get. So I won't warn that meeting. You know, I can warn the meeting mm -hmm. of the 29th after we meet on the 22nd. Mm -hmm. And I can put the dog ordinance in the parking lot so we don't forget it. Does that sound okay for right now? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Okay. All right. Any other questions about the upcoming agendas? Hearing none. Uh, we'll do a session. We don't need to do it. And we'll entertain a moment. Uh, motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Motion second. All those aye. 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 aye.